Mere Hay, a quiet and apparently tranquil suburb of Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire. In one house on smart and comfortable Waterdale Grove, a couple are celebrating their anniversary. Lee and Kate Knight have been married for seven years. A special meal to mark this special day has been carefully prepared. Kate has arranged for Lee to have his favourite food. Curry, accompanied by a full-bodied red wine. Lee has it all. A beautiful home, a son upon whom he dotes, and a rock-solid job as a team leader making excavators with JCB. He has no way of knowing all is about to be shattered. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Days after the meal, Lee is rushed into emergency surgery. He sinks into a coma. His survival hangs in the balance. The Darleston, a former coaching inn just outside Stoke in the late 90s. Kate, who was 19, worked here. Lee, her future husband, was a customer. The first time I saw Kate, she was working in, in a mum and stepdad's pub. I, I thought, oh, she, she's nice looking. <laughs> so, um, every time I went into the pub, I'd, I'd make sure that I spoke to Kate. And I knew that she had a boyfriend at the time. Um, when I found out that she split up with a boyfriend, I, I thought, I'd, I asked her if she wanted to go out. We'd be pretty much saw each other every night after that. The relationship blossomed swiftly. She was very outgoing. She, she liked the things I liked. We liked the same music. We liked to go to the same places. Um, she was very, I suppose you call it, bubbly. We, we always laughed and moved together. But when Lee took Kate home to meet his mum, Annette, another side to Kate emerged. I do like people make themselves at home and my own, but not on the sort of first visit. She came in the house, opened the kitchen cupboard doors. What well, can we have tea? I thought, oh dear, my goodness. She liked uh, the last say and everything. Very domineering. From the start, it was clear Kate wanted to move up in the world. She started night school. She took bookkeeping exams, which she said she was successful in. Um, and as it turned out through the inquiry, financial gain was an important part of her life, and what she was motivated by. In 1998, Lee and Kate Knight got married the wedding was brought forward because she was pregnant with their son. We were both very excited. We only had the wedding at, at the registry office in Hamley, but uh, it, was just, it was a brilliant day. There's lots of people there who we both knew. They moved into a terraced house, but it was clear this was not good enough for Kate. She always said she didn't want to live in a terraced house. It was like, no, we won't go live in the country. Which you know, everybody does, don't you? Oh, we've got this now. When we move again, we want to move on to something better. Lee was working hard, up to seven days a week, to keep his wife happy. He was a team leader at JCB in Roaster, Staffordshire. He earned £500 a week in take-home pay. I was happy to put in 50 to 55 hours a week uh, to support my wife and my son and uh, keep the house that we got and the cars and everything. We never really had a lot of money, but if we needed anything, we'd always got enough money to buy anything. Among his workmates, Lee was a respected figure. He was hard working, very, very popular. Lee was the kind of person who you could rely on. He would never, he would never let you down. But as hard as Lee may have been working, living within her means was not within Kate's makeup. Everything was disposable or replaceable. Everything was a bit easy come, easy go, you know. 
um, the furniture, you don't look after it, oh it's okay, it doesn't matter, you can have another one. Which is fine if you've got the money. Kate developed a hunger for money, which was to change her life and Lee's forever. Whilst Lee Knight was hard at work earning money to support his son and his wife Kate, she was left in charge of the finances and she was showing less appetite for work. She'd start a job, she'd be there two, three weeks and she'd come in, oh, they're making me manager. Well, you know, nobody makes a, a manager of a person when they've only been there three weeks. But she'd only last three months, three and a half months at the very most as any job and then she'd finish or be finished, we don't know. Eventually, she told certain friends she'd fallen off a chair and was unable to work, but to others, she said she'd been appointed by a company to work from home as a bereavement counsellor. She said she was working for a company called Babcom, but I found out there's no such company and she hasn't worked for three years. Well, it's not nice being lied to, especially by your wife. That Kate's world was, was somewhat different than the real world out there. She was um, best described as a fantasy system in respect of what she was telling people was going on and really what actually was going on. Didn't believe anything much she said, you know, unless you saw it, you don't believe it, you know. She was just a, a liar, a fantasizer, you know. <laughs> But through Lee's hard work and overtime, the Knights were able to move up market into the comfortable suburb of Mere Hay and a smart house on Waterdale Grove at a cost of £65,000. It was brilliant. It just felt better. It was a three bedroom, seven detached house on Mere Hay. It was a new house, it was, only, it was only about three years old. It was a nice neighbourhood, we've got nice, nice people that are living around us. Not long after we moved in, uh, Kate became pregnant again. But uh, after about six weeks, she, she said she'd had a, a miscarriage. But I, I think that, I felt that brought us closer. After that, we, we brought a puppy. So we used to take him out for walks a lot, all three of us together. And I, I thought it was just normal life, that's, that's, that's how things go. But Kate still wasn't satisfied. Soon she was putting her lying skills to new use, forging Lee's signature to extend the mortgage to £125,000 and take out a string of other secret loans. You could see her financial motivation in the loans that she took out. She wasn't working herself, so she had to use Lee's name. In fact, the people who arranged the loans never actually saw Lee, and he never knew about them. Kate made sure it stayed that way. She kept the paperwork out of sight. As far as debt was concerned, I didn't think we had any. I just don't know where the money went at all. Never fully answered. Some of the money uh, was used to refinance some of the later loans. Um, and it, it seemed to be no, no rhyme or reason, really. There was uh, a loan taken out with one bank, and at the same time, she was under pressure to repay a loan with the other bank. So he used a chunk of the, the new loan to satisfy the old lenders. And to explain the fact that she now sometimes had ready cash, Kate invented another cover story. She told Lee that um, she was working She's employed in the call centre, and therefore she was getting paid cash in hand. Lee, previously to this, at this time, was uh, giving her X, X hundreds of pounds each week to pay for the housekeeping and your normal household bills. But then Kate said she'd got a job, so Lee no longer had to do that. As part of her strategy of hiding evidence of the loans from Lee, Kate said there was a problem with the post. She arranged to collect her mail directly from the sorting office so he would never see the unpaid bills. But as debts mounted, she grew increasingly desperate about how she could pay them off. 
Then, fatefully, she had an idea. Kate must have realised that the answer to her financial problems was right in front of her, that if Lee died, she stood to gain at least £140,000 from JCB in an insurance payout. That amount would bring security and leave her free to build a new life with her son. Which one did you get for Christmas? But Lee showed no sign of dying of his own accord, so Kate decided to help him along. She started a course of action which she was clearly committed to uh, in order to attempt to kill her husband and claim on the life insurance from JCB. The idea of claiming the life insurance must have played on her mind, it must have festered there. It must have been a fantasy initially, but there must have come a point where it tipped over into reality. Bizarrely, Kate took into her confidence a neighbour called Sarah Johnson, who lived three doors down the street. It's hard to believe that anybody who was actually thinking of killing their husband would tell their friend and neighbour all about it and how they were going to do it. It's strange. Why? Why would she tell if? Why would she tell anybody? But she did. It started with an extraordinary request. Initially, Kate approached Sarah and asked her if she knew a hitman. She said that there was £50,000 in it for Sarah if she did know one. Well, clearly, Sarah was amazed to be asked this question and, and uh, initially didn't take it seriously, as I don't think you would. To start with, she, she said, my friend needs a hitman, to hide it in that type of context but it became very clear to Sarah relatively soon that he was a fat. She herself, she was talking about. Sarah just thought it was fantasy. Kate explored other ways of getting rid of Lee. Kate had been searching online about the effects of ecstasy. She'd actually typed in, how fatal can eight pills be? Kate claimed in a conversation with Sarah that she'd got 10 ecstasy tablets and that she was going to feed them to Lee during the course of a day when they were going up to Liverpool to visit her mum. It was Kate's intention to put the ecstasy tablets into Lee's drink, and this was a, the first hint that, uh, of poisoning that we, we heard of in the inquiry. At about this time, Lee had a couple of days off work. I said to Kate, have you given me drugs? Because I felt, I don't know why it's, I felt ill, really ill. And she started to cry, and so I said, why would I give you drugs? I'd, I wouldn't give you drugs, I love you. And she, she cried and cried and so I, I thought I'd just, I was just ill, but I, I couldn't sleep. And then it happened again. Kate had done me a Coca-Cola with me tea and I got this ill feeling again. Kate's intentions were about to become more explicit. She and Sarah visited the chemists. Kate had a conversation with the pharmacist and the chemist about liquid iron solution or iron tablet. Hi, can I help you? Hi, yes. I'm wondering if you can help me. Do you sell it? The chemist, Andrew Picard, testified at Kate's trial. In the conversation I had with, with Kate, the concerns I have with something like this is obviously making sure that uh, the person who it's for knows exactly what dose to take. Obviously, in uh, overdosage, then iron preparations can be poisonous. The problem was, Kate was vague about who'd be taking the iron. At first, she suggested it would be herself, but then she changed her story. Um, well, it's um, she she to to Kate's nan was dead, and Sarah knew it. Sarah challenged Kate about the fact that her nan had passed away. When it became clear to Sarah in that conversation that Kate was intent upon the course of action that she'd previously told her about. Kate justified it by saying that she'd receive the money from JCB, she'd be able to settle the mortgage, she'd have the house, and she and her son would be happy. But liquid iron, especially in the necessary quantities, would be hard to disguise. Kate appears to have rejected it as a potential poison, but something was affecting Lee's health. I was really sick. 
I, I was I detached all the time. It was strange. People around me kept saying, you're not right, you should go home and should have some time off. But I, I thought it was just a flu, so I carried on as normal. The truth may have been far more sinister. Sarah Johnson came round to Kate's for coffee. Kate produced a bottle of antifreeze from the cupboard under the kitchen sink and asked Sarah to smell it, which she did. Sarah described it smelling as a strong chemical smell. She then pulled out a bottle of wine and asked Sarah to smell that. She said it had got a diesel, petrol kind of smell to it. And then Kate told Sarah that she'd already put antifreeze into that bottle of wine, which she'd smell. Incredibly, Sarah said that she actually tasted it. She said she didn't know why she did it. She felt overpowered by Kate, and it was like a dream. Sarah said she could only taste wine. Kate said she'd been researching the effects of antifreeze online. Kate then said that she was going to poison Lee's curry that night. And she said she'd also done it the night before. And Lee complained that it had got a, a tinny taste to it. Harmless enough outside the body, antifreeze, which contains ethylene glycol, is converted into acids if ingested with potentially lethal effect. Professor Robert Forrest is a toxicologist who gave evidence at Kate Knight's trial. It's not that ethylene glycol itself is poisonous. It is what it is converted into in the body that's poisonous. The final acid that it produces is stuff called oxalic acid, ketocleaner, and it combines with calcium in your blood to form calcium oxalate crystals, which are deposited in your kidney, in your brain, and in other places like the lining of your gut. The crystals can cause dramatic damage. This is a section of kidney looked at under the microscope from a person who has died as a result of ethylene glycol poisoning. And the striking feature is these crystals of ethylene glycol which are deposited in the kidney and which can be seen very clearly. The crystals cause kidney failure. Elsewhere in the body they trigger brain damage, blindness, deafness and bleeding from the gut. A simple experiment shows how lethally reactive the acid is with the calcium found in every cell of the human body. One beaker contains oxalic acid solution, the other a calcium solution. And what we're looking for is some cloudiness. So this cloudiness is calcium oxalate thrashing out a solution. If I pour it through filter paper, you'll be able to see the actual crystals themselves. And it's these crystals of oxalic acid that are so damaging to the body. In the Knight household, the devastating effects of those chemical reactions were about to be unleashed. April the 4th, 2005, the most likely date upon which Lee was poisoned. It's Kate and Lee's seventh wedding anniversary. Kate is preparing dinner. I was looking forward to it in the day. I think I finished work a bit earlier that night to, to get home. The couple have decided on takeaway curry and red wine. I thought she loved me. We were very close together, we were very good together. But love is not what Kate has in mind. Well, ethylene glycol starts off, it tastes sweet. It's mildly intoxicating, so you feel as if you're drunk. Every sip of wine and every mouthful that Lee took sent him further down a slope which led to the edge of death. Antifreeze is potentially lethal. Half a cupful is enough to kill anybody. And if you don't get prompt treatment, I'm afraid the outlook's really bleak. It wasn't long before the poison took hold, but Lee's condition was to mystify doctors and without swift diagnosis and treatment, he could die.
For their seventh wedding anniversary dinner, Kate Knight added a special ingredient to the curry she was preparing for her husband. Lee Knight had hurried home from his work at JCB to be with her. Kate had been researching the potentially lethal effects of antifreeze on the body. Lee went to work for the first two days of the week and then reported sick, which in itself was a rarity because his uh, attendance record at JCB was uh, virtually 100%. Uh, he then became very unwell, which falls in line with the anniversary meal being an attempt by Kate to poison him. I got really bad stomach pains and I kept on being sick. Um, everything that I, I had to drink, I was just I was sick again. And uh, I said, I need to go see the doctor, my stomach's really hurting. Five days after the dinner, Lee was admitted to University Hospital, North Staffordshire. He was in a bad way. His head was lolling around, he couldn't breathe properly. He hadn't urinated for several days, which was a clear indication of kidney problems. To save his life, doctors had to carry out a procedure which would wash away vital evidence. When the doctors discovered that Lee's kidneys weren't functioning, they very quickly put him on a dialysis machine, which replaces the function of the kidneys and cleans the body. However, at the same time as cleaning the body, any evidence that was inside Lee at that time would have been cleaned away by the dialysis treatment. So that became an issue when the police became involved in the inquiry. Lee was too ill to realise, but the cause of his illness was still a mystery. Well, I didn't really know what was going on. It was just things happening around me. So it was really scary. The doctors were treating him for, for every symptom that they could see, but as to the cause of his condition, they didn't know. The doctors were initially baffled about exactly what was wrong with Lee. His condition was getting worse. Facial paralysis was setting in. His hearing was starting to go. His condition was getting really bad. On the fourth day in hospital, events took a dramatic turn for the worse. Lee began hemorrhaging from a duodenal ulcer. Acids from the antifreeze had eaten into his living tissue. The bed was just oozing with blood. I couldn't even be looking down and there was blood everywhere. Loads and loads of blood. And I think, I don't know if I, I passed out or something, and I, the next thing I remember, it's, it's like four months later. I was quite upset and alarmed, like, and the nurses came running and I passed out. Lee needed emergency surgery to cauterise the ulcer. If they operated, there'd only be a 60% chance of him surviving because he was losing so much blood. Without the operation, he'd die anyway. So uh, sent for his family. So we went to pick Kate up and they were met with a father-in-law uh, opened the bedroom window and said, she's only just gone to bed. He says, but I'll wake her up, we'll be up there as soon as possible. Well, she never came. She never came, we never saw her. Lee was um, underwent surgery for the, for the bleed that, that wouldn't stop bleeding. Uh, he had received blood transfusions, um, and as a result of the operation, um, they managed to cauterise the, the ulcer, which they ultimately discovered was the cause of the bleed, um, and then he was in intensive care thereafter. But at the time, it was a you know, very scary time for the family. Lee had now sunk into a coma. I felt as if my world had fell apart. I just couldn't take it in that he could, he could go, you know. I welled him back. I really welled him back. I talked to him constant. Um, I rubbed his arms. I, well, I talked to him. I sang to him. I wouldn't let him go. Nor if I could help it, he wasn't going to leave me. In the struggle to reach a diagnosis, doctors took a biopsy of Lee's kidney. The telltale crystals which indicate antifreeze or ethylene glycol poisoning showed up, but the results were inconclusive. This is a kidney biopsy, a tiny core, not much thicker than a human hair, of Lee's kidney, which was taken when the doctors were trying to work out what had happened to him. You can see there's only three crystals obvious in that tiny section of kidney. Far fewer than in a sample taken from someone who died without the crystals being washed away by dialysis. There was always going to be 
a problem for the prosecution who are going to have to differentiate his kidney from the classical appearance that you see in the kidney taken at post-mortem when somebody has died as a result of ethylene glycol poisoning. One of the doctors suggested that ethylene gly glycol poisoning may be responsible for the condition that Lee was in due to the presence of various crystals in Lee's kidney. Um, but because ethylene glycol poisoning is 99% as far as the medics were concerned, seen with people who self-harm, then they discounted it because that is not what they believed they were looking at with Leonard. Just after the doctors had done a biopsy on Lee, Kate bumped into her neighbour, Sarah Johnson, in the street. According to Sarah, Kate said that her plan had worked, that nothing had shown up on the biopsy, and that if she hadn't have called an ambulance, Lee would have been a goner. And then she added, damn. At this point, Sarah still believes that Kate's fantasising about these things making it up as you go along if you like. Then something happened which brought it home to Sarah Johnson that this wasn't fantasy at all. She bumped into Lee's cousin. They chatted for a little while before Sarah asked Lee's cousin how Lee was because Sarah hadn't seen him for a while. Lee's cousin said that he was in a hospital, seriously ill. The doctors had no idea what was the problem with him, uh, and he was in intensive care. Sarah was clearly horrified. Um, she Im immediately told Lee's cousin what Kate had said to her. Obviously, all Kate dropped into place for at that point. The cousin immediately called Lee's family. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Um, when my niece told me, I thought, what do we do? Suppose it isn't true, and um, we go and tell somebody what's it going to cause, the biggest row anybody can have in the family. I thought she couldn't, no way could she have done this. But we ran the hospital, and they said, come up straight away, which we did. And the doctor took us in a room with the sister. I said, could this be what was wrong with Lee? And he stood up and he said, my advice to you is go to the police and go now. And he never said nothing else. He walked out of the room. I myself went round to Kate's address uh, and arrested for the attempting murder of her husband, Lee. She uh, was clearly made a lot of noise and was seemingly upset about the allegation being made against her. But she was making a lot of noise without shedding a tear. Police searched the house. We recovered from the cupboard under the sink a nearly full canister of Tesco home brand antifreeze. It turned out there was, there was literally 160 mils missing from the litre bottle. That's about a cupful, and the experts reckon you only need about half a cupful to kill you. Lee had no idea the canister existed. I don't know how we got the... Well, I'd, I'd never buy antifreeze from Tesco's. Police found handbags stuffed with paperwork relating to loans and the thousands of pounds of debt run up by Kate. Kate told us that it was the first time that she'd seen the documentation that we produced. She told us that uh, Lee was in charge of the household finances uh, and that she'd never seen the final demand letters or the letters from the loan companies. Lee has maintained throughout it was Kate who handled the bills. I didn't know anything about any debt. Apparently I found out since I came out of hospital. Uh, she, she wasn't paying any of the household bills. Police also seized the computer. They found Kate had tried to hide her internet searches, but investigators were able to unscramble the information. There are certain moments in the inquiry when I, I knew we were onto something. One of those was Kate had committed herself during the interview to saying that she'd used the computer to research the least symptoms, but only after Lee had been hospitalised. But police could prove this was a lie. Kate had been researching the effects of antifreeze, ecstasy and liquid iron before Lee was taken ill. There was enough evidence to take Kate to court. At the initial hearing, she denied attempted murder and was allowed out on bail. She moved to the Wirral, taking her son, and a whole lot more. Annette found Kate emptying the house of furniture. 
They had a phone call off a neighbour that she was emptying the house. I'm not a vicious person, but I was so angry and hurt, I caught a taxi and went across. While I was horrible, I was the most horriblest person. I shouted, I called it, I swore at it. If it had got it in me, I'd have killed her that day for taking my son's furniture. For emptying his own, what he'd worked hard for. After being in a coma for 10 weeks, Lee regained consciousness, but his sight, hearing and kidneys were damaged forever. I wake up to find out that my wife had tried to kill me. I must have been able to hear what people were saying. Um, uh, when I woke up, the, the first thing I, I said apparently was I asked my mum if Kate had done this to me. Uh, that, that was the first time I was, I was aware of it, really. Uh, then, then people gradually told me what, what was happening. And I, I was gutted. I was, I was devastated. Very upsetting. It still, it still upsets me now. But his family were simply overjoyed he'd pulled through. A really happy, happy day, like, you know, he, he, he wasn't out of the woods by a long chalk, but he, he wasn't in intensive care and he wasn't on the critical list. The nurses cheered, the doctors cheered, because they never thought he'd have gone out, gone out of that ward, not alive anyway. However, the antifreeze was continuing its evil work on Lee's nervous system, senses and brain. When I first woke up, I could see and hear. Um, and I think it took a few weeks for, for my eyes and my ears to stop working. It was really scary because it, nobody could communicate with me. They used to have to write in block capitals on my hands. And that, that was really hard to learn, that was. I used to cry a lot that the nurses on, on Ward 29 were, were brilliant with me. You know, they, they used to come in and just hold me on to stop me being upset. Um, yeah, they were really good to me. The damage ran deep. Doctors established Lee's sight and hearing would never recover. Once again, the family were devastated. Absolutely gutted, because we'd kept thinking, it'll come back, it'll come back. You know, and that's what we kept holding on to, it'll come back. But when they said, no, it definitely won't, won't. Well, you think about him before yourself, you know, how's he going to take it? But his tickets on the chin. But there was still no forensic proof that Kate had caused this damage. It was always going to be a difficult thing. I knew that we faced a challenge during the trial, proving how and where Kate had poisoned Lee. It was touch and go whether Kate would be convicted. Late 2007, and at Stafford Crown Court, the trial of Kate Knight is imminent. She's accused of attempting to murder her husband, Lee, by poisoning him with antifreeze. But he's been left blind and deaf, potentially a major problem in terms of giving evidence in court. The Cochlear Implant Centre in Manchester is rushing his case through, so he'll be able to hear in time for the trial. OK, then, Lee, we're ready. OK. The buckets hold water. The buckets hold water. He listens to his father. He listens to his father. OK, good. The room's getting cold. The woman's getting cold. Lee's been given two cochlear implant hearing aids. The cochlear implant has a, a microphone as a hearing aid would do, and that is where the external sound is picked up. That's then analysed and processed by this part of the, the implant. That information then goes across the skin by radio frequency to the internal implant and the brain interprets that as sound. They're fantastic. I, I come from hearing no sound at all to hearing everything. Um, I can have proper conversations again. So it's a fantastic, massive difference. But even with Lee able to testify, there was no guarantee of conviction. The police faced particular challenges in this case. There were no eyewitnesses. The forensic evidence wasn't conclusive. 
and an example of that was the biopsy that the doctors took on Lee. The oxalate crystals that form with ethylene glycol poisoning were really minimal. Lack of medical evidence which could only have been caused by antifreeze was just one problem for the prosecution. We'd never definitively proved when Kate had poisoned Lee, um, but the case was more than just the medical case. There were far more um, types of evidence that we were bringing forward to the court, the computer, and the evidence of the witnesses who came to court as well. The defence tried to suggest Lee's illness had been due to heavy drinking. I didn't really up drinking with my mates a lot. We, we probably go out four or five times a year at the most. <laughs> Sometimes we, we, we go for a curry, but the, the, the women had come with us. It's okay to be there. Uh, I used to have some, some kinds of lager in the house, but I was never de dependent on it, like Kate tried to say that I was. Um, I never had to have time off work for being drunk or anything like that. The prosecution kept Lee away from court till he gave evidence. They hoped his condition would have a dramatic effect on the jury of ten women and two men. I was so positioned in court that I could see the jury rather than seeing Lee enter the court. Uh, and his, his entry did make, seem to make an impact with the jury. He is the ultimate gentle giant and that very much came across when he gave his evidence in court. After two days of deliberation, the jury returned a unanimous verdict of guilty. As Kate was led away to await sentence, a friend rang Lee, who was with his sister-in-law, to give him the news. He said she'd been found guilty, and we, we both cheered. <laughs> we were outside Tesco cheering, waiting for a taxi. It was brilliant. This also meant Lee would at last be reunited with his nine-year-old son, who had previously been living with Kate. Then I realised that he was going to be here living with us, so I was really, really excited. It was brilliant. Really chuffed. It was brilliant. I won't say no more. For the first time since his illness, Lee has returned to JCB to be reunited with his former colleagues. This is the first time Lee's been back, and as you can see, he was just really really popular with, with the people who he was team leading over. The devastation he caused with his, with his work colleagues, once they found out, they, 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 they took it quite hard. I was a bit nervous because obviously I haven't seen anybody, any of them for like nearly three years, but it was brilliant. They're, they're, they're a good bunch of people, everybody here. There's brighter news in other areas of Lee's life too. The poisoning left him needing dialysis three times a week, but his brother Michael has offered one of his kidneys so Lee can have a transplant. What can I say about Michael? <laughs> He's given me a big part of his body. Uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to say thank you enough for it. Um, He's going to have a nice score for me, <laughs> which he didn't have before. I was just, all I can say is thanks. If there's anything I can do to help him, I will do. I'm so proud of Michael. He's taking everything at a pinch of salt, you know. He'll say to Lee, I'm going on holiday this weekend, I'm taking your kidney with me, it's all right. <laughs> and Lee'll say to him, Don't get drinking, don't make a mess of my kidney. <laughs> and that's how they joke about it, as if they just give him one another, you know, a birthday present. Well, I mean, it's get to life. It's, it's, this game makes such a difference to Lee's life. And uh, where I am terrified. Hi Lee, just Hi checking you. you're okay. Are you comfy okay. there? Just check your arm. Yeah. But as they wait to hear whether a transplant is feasible, Kate comes up for sentencing. Okay then Lee. Thanks. See you in there. Okay, sure. I'm going to suffer for all my life. Obviously I don't think she'll get a life sentence. Um, I'd like to see her serve at least 10 years. But the judge describes Kate as a fantasist who callously and mercilessly watched her husband Lee become desperately ill and said nothing to help. As she weeps in the dock, he sentences her to 30 years. 
For the media, this has been a big story. Despite her scheming, Knight left a trail of evidence which, through detailed investigation, we were able to build into a strong case, resulting in her prison sentence today. I've been covering courts for over 30 years, and that's the heaviest fixed sentence that I've ever heard passed. The judge said that it was meant to be a deterrent, and I think it was a deterrent sentence. The judge was very clear when sentencing to explain his reasons for sentence, and he went into detail about the aggravating factors, the research that she put into the offence, the lack of remorse that she has shown, the fact that well, she had the knowledge that would have assisted the medics in treating her husband. I was ecstatic that she did get 30 years. I expected her to get 10 years at the most. Uh, and when I, when I heard that she got 30, I was really pleased. Uh, it keeps out of mine and my son's life for a long time, hopefully. And uh, lets them get used to things, as they all know. Lee is rebuilding his life. Don't get me wrong, he's been upset on occasions and he gets frustrated uh, a lot, like, you know, but he took any, how anybody can take what he's been through and being blind and deaf on top of it is beyond me. I don't know, I don't know how he's took it. He's took everything in his stride, you know, and it takes one hell of a bloke to do that. I don't think there's many more that could do it, you know, but that's Lee. Lee now has a girlfriend, the nurse who's been giving him dialysis. JCB are continuing his sick pay, and he's learned the kidney transplant can go ahead. But the spectre of Kate will always be with him. I, I, I tried not to think about Kate at all. Um, in a pit of my stomach, I, I hated her for it. I, 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 how could somebody do this to somebody they claimed that they loved? I just wanted her to pay for what she's done. I don't, I don't want harm to come to her, because that's, that'd be too easy. I want her to be in prison for a long time, so that she suffers. I mean, I'm going to suffer for the rest of my life. It's a leafy suburb in Cheshire. Sale is a nice suburban area of Manchester. It's wealthy, it's a place that people aspire to live. Good schools, uh, good shops, um, quite a nice area. Armsby Avenue is typical, quiet, unassuming. It sometimes amazes you what, what actually goes on behind closed doors. That was certainly true of number 77 Armsby Avenue and the couple who lived there. 38-year-old Tracy Seward was a housewife and mother to three children, but she had another life on the internet and even another name. There's a number of videos that were recovered showing a variety of things. To her male fans all over the world, Tracy was known as Stiletto. That gives her an image. It creates a fantasy. Stiletto had so much power over her internet admirers that they called her the goddess and would do anything for her. water park, a place where families go kayaking and sailing. But below the surface, the waters held a hidden secret. We were searching with our hands, uh, more or less patting as, as you go along. Police frogmen retrieved mysterious lumps of concrete, which they brought to the surface for further examination. And that was the point at which we were able as a team then to think, OK, this is, uh, you know, we've got, we've got something we can really work with now. What they found was a vital clue in a tale of betrayal, domination, and ultimately, death. Armsby Avenue in suburban Sale was the family home to Tracy Seward and her partner of 20 years, Philip Briley. Philip and Tracy were childhood sweethearts. They'd met when she was 14, they'd fallen in love. They bought themselves a house, they moved to a nice part of Manchester, um, and they, they had um, what they you know, enjoyed as a really good life together. The couple had three children, and the family moved from ashton under to Sale, a more middle-class suburb of Manchester with better schools. 
to the outside world, everything was perfect. But on the 11th of June 2001, 42-year-old Briley disappeared from his family home in suburban Sale. Remarkably, his partner Tracy didn't seem too concerned, but Philip's sister, Christine, was worried. Philip's sister was the one that had last seen him. Um, it was so out of character for him not to make contact with her, with the family. She really felt strongly that there was something wrong. Something, a gut instinct, I think, told her that something was very wrong. And she took it upon herself to push Tracy to inform the police that he'd gone missing. Under pressure from Christine, Tracy Seward eventually reported Philip Riley's disappearance to Greater Manchester Police. Police officers went to the house shortly after Tracy contacted us, which was a week after Philip's disappearance. In the initial inquiries, they just found it was a normal suburban house in, in Manchester. The police weren't unduly alarmed, especially when they were told why Philip had left. Tracy's version of events uh, that she uh, provided to the officers was that uh, her and Philip had had a, a row uh, late one evening into the early hours of the following morning, which, which wasn't, as she said, unusual uh, in their relationship. Uh, and the culmination of that row, he'd uh, packed his bags, got into a, his car and, and driven off, uh, and she hadn't seen him since. My suspicions were aroused right at the very beginning of it because we get so many missing from homes. He was an adult male, um, he was, had wife and children, and these things do happen. It is quite a regular occurrence for adults to go missing, uh, and a week's disappearance from an adult is, is not uh, particularly unique. But when Philip missed his youngest son's birthday two weeks later, his sister became even more anxious. This was just so out of character for Philip, he, just something that he would never have done. Um, there was no phone call, there was no contact. Um, and the fact that Tracy didn't seem to be too concerned about this, I think, was the, the element that the family found so disturbing. They, they couldn't understand why um, she didn't seem concerned that he'd gone away and, and had missed this important birthday. Detectives first became suspicious when they discovered that Tracy had changed all the bills into her name and that Philip had left his mobile phone behind. If people are, are going to go missing in the circumstances that Tracy suggested, uh, we would have expected he would have taken his mobile phone with him. And clearly, it, it was so unusual that he didn't have any contact with his, his other family that, that didn't live too far away. Uh, he, he was a man who did keep in touch with his, his, his family from, from his own side. Wherever he went, he always had the phone with him. So that was a major concern to us. And when we followed the contacts from the phone to his associates, they reinforced that concern that Philip would just never leave his phone. He was always with him. The police decided it was time to pay another visit to the couple's home in Arnsby Avenue. They carried out a search and were surprised at what they found. There's a number of videos that we recovered which showed um, different sexual practices which aren't commonly practiced or even known about um, across the country. The videos revealed the bizarre second life of Tracy Seward. She had her own website, and on it she wasn't Tracy, she was Stiletto. On the internet, she was a dominatrix, there to fulfill the desires of men interested in bondage and sadomasochism. Detectives discovered that the garage of her home had been turned into a film set where the perverted movies were shot. One of them was obviously filmed in the garage of the address, and it involved Tracy dressed in various guises. But even hardened detectives were not prepared for what some of the videos contained. Some of them were really graphic. One of them, she was crushing small invertebrates like woodlice and worms and things like that. It was quite disturbing watching those videos. Crush it. Crush it. Crush it. In June 2001, 42-year-old Philip Riley went missing from his home in the Greater Manchester suburb of Sale. Detectives investigating his disappearance soon discovered the missing man's partner, Tracy Seward, was not a typical suburban housewife. Tracy, on the internet, was known as Stiletto. She was known as a sadomasochist and a dominatrix, and that meant that the people that she met, the men, it was men that she met on the internet, who couldn't find that kind of sexual gratification anywhere else, became gradually under her control. 
you can take a personality on the internet which doesn't necessarily relate to your real life personality. So for example, Seward was known as Stiletto on the internet. That gives her an image, it creates a fantasy, it heightens the fantasy. Often you can say things on the internet which aren't at all true. And what that seems to do is to serve to heighten the awareness of what might be going on, to heighten the experience of being dominated so that you take it to a different level, that it no longer remains a fantasy which is private and secret and sometimes furtive, but might be a fantasy which can be made real and go to the next level. As a dominatrix, Tracy Seward specialised in a rare sexual fetish called crushing at its tamest. Tracy was pictured crushing inanimate objects, but she also regularly used her stilettos on living creatures. Crushing is simply those people who will take an interest in a woman wearing very kind of stylized shoes, crushing small animals, killing them. It's almost a snuff movie for animals. I think it was a first time, certainly a lot of the officers and I had come across this particular fetish uh, of crushing small animals. Uh, clearly quite sickening in many ways to, to look at these sort of images. And it really gave the insight into what Tracy was all about, the fact that she was prepared to do these things, which very few people, women, would want to do, and the fact that she then became dominant and controlling over the people that wanted these things done, but found it very hard to find a dominatrix who would do it to them. Detectives discovered Tracy's persona as the internet dominatrix Stiletto had started at home with Philip as a sexual fetish the couple shared. The couple then began taking photos and videos of Tracy in her roller stiletto and selling them on the internet. Some men, especially men often who are, uh, have power in their working lives, like to be dominated. It's a way of relieving stress. Some men who like to be dominated like to be dominated because they have always been dominated by a more powerful woman in their lives, not necessarily a mother, perhaps a sister, perhaps a girlfriend. So the, the range of behaviours that can lead a man to want to be dominated are as varied as the number of men themselves. Within a short time, Tracy had become an internet porn star with a number of totally obsessed male followers around the world who were, in some cases, virtual slaves. They even wore t-shirts printed with the words, property of the goddess. The internet's ability to allow people to make contact can bring with it some very difficult consequences for us as a society, as a culture, in how to manage those people with like-minded interests that might become too extreme. It made us really worried about what else she may well have on those videos and what she was doing with her other clients. The detectives found Tracy had become particularly close to one of her internet fans, a 26-year-old Swiss man called Jonah Previtelli. The relationship developed into a full-blown affair, and at one point she went to live with him in Switzerland. It was a love triangle. She'd actually um, got in with a younger man, um, was obviously having a really good time. He had a big house, he had a swimming pool in the garden. And she liked the life, she enjoyed the life, she wanted the life, and I think that um, Philip was being left behind. Um, he was at home, he was caring for the children, he was making sure that their needs were being met. But Briarly wanted Tracy back, despite warnings from his relatives. Family were putting pressure onto him to say, look, just get rid of Tracy, just let her go. It's easier to let her go than try and force her to come back and, you know, have a stormy relationship. But no, he wanted her back. Tracy did come back. She told Philip that her affair with Previtelli was over and she gave the same story to police investigating his disappearance. But detectives were about to find out that not everything Tracy told them was true. <laughs> The biggest breakthrough for me in this investigation while it was a mission from home was the finding of Philip's burnt out car. Tracy had told the police that when Philip stormed out, he had taken his car with him. This presented us with a direct contradiction to Tracy's account, uh, really, as to him having gone abroad with his car and the fact there was no report from him, from Philip, about the theft potentially or the, the burning out of this car. That was a very, very strong signal to me. It wasn't good news. It made us more concerned for Philip. We now had his phone, we now had his car burnt out. We had no indication anywhere that he was still alive, so it gave us grave concerns for Philip Reilly's welfare.
And I started to form the opinion there and then that Philip was actually dead. Uh, and if he was dead, then the investigation had to take on a new form to find out who had actually killed him. Once again, the detective team returned to call on Tracy Seward. And once again, they were in for a surprise discovery. We went there early one morning, knocked on the door, went in, and we found Tracy in bed with her lover, Prevatali, which was brilliant for us. The man between the sheets was Tracy's 26-year-old Swiss toy boy, Jonah Prevatelli. We first heard the name Prevatelli mentioned uh, as part of the Missing From Home inquiry as we tried to get more information about uh, Tracy's background and the relationship she had with Philip. She mentioned the fact that she'd had uh, a relationship with Prevatelli, that Philip had known about that relationship, and Philip in turn had known, as she said, that, that she had finished that relationship with Prevatelli. It was clear that by the fact that Tracy was in bed with her lover that neither of them were concerned that Philip really was going to come back in the house. The couple's relationship was clearly back on, giving them a motive to kill Philip Brierley. Detectives decided they had enough evidence to arrest them for questioning. At that point, we knew absolutely very, really virtually nothing about Prevatali at all, other than, again, what Trace had told us, that uh, he was a Swiss national with whom she'd met uh, on the internet in their fetish of, of S&M, uh, and that she'd had a relationship with him. And, and beyond that, we knew very little about him at that time when he was first arrested. The arrest was really the start of the next phase of the inquiry, and really we knew, we were convinced that they knew something. Exactly what their involvement was, we weren't 100% of, but we knew something was really, really wrong. But we didn't know what, we didn't know where it happened, and we didn't know what the involvement was of these two people, though we knew it was quite heavy. But when they were questioned at Altrincham Police Station, Tracy Seward and Jonah Prevatelli didn't give detectives any new information. Both Tracy and Prevatelli were very calm during their stay in custody. They gave the impression that they had done nothing wrong. They were uh, very intelligent and cool and calm and collected. And clearly we were looking for a breakthrough in the case by the initial interviews of them both. Uh, unfortunately, uh, over the first period of interviews, first day or so, uh, we didn't get any great cooperation from either of them, which took the investigation any further forward. After several hours of questioning and with no new evidence, Greater Manchester Police faced the prospect of having to release the couple. We didn't expect to be able to keep them in, which was pretty frustrating for the whole investigative team, because you had people in who you knew, both Prevatali and Seward, who were involved in the disappearance of Brearley. And at that time, we were pretty convinced it was a murder, and you're going to have to let them go, so it was pretty frustrating. But just as the detectives were about to set the couple free, they had a stroke of luck. And in an amazing coincidence, it was one of their own policemen who gave the inquiry team a vital clue. Had a look on the board, we have a big white board. And I noticed there were two people with uh, murder next to their names. I walked down one corridor and had a look in, uh, in through the hatch, put a, a face to a name. I saw Previtali in there, uh, looked, and I realised that I recognised him straight away. When I looked at him, I thought, where have I saw you from? Then PC Trigg remembered why Prevatelli looked so familiar. Two weeks earlier, and whilst he was off duty, PC Trigg had been jogging near a water park and canal system in Sale. He saw a car that aroused his suspicions. I came across this bridge here. As I came across, I noticed a vehicle. It was a purple vehicle. There was a man stood next to it, had a long trench coat on. It just seemed really odd to be in the location that he was. Um, so as I, I ran past, I noted the, the vehicle and the part of the registration, thinking that, you know, something might be going on here. It was very strange. PC Trigg continued his jog and was surprised to come across the same vehicle again. This time, he saw two men. Suspicions are aroused even more now, thinking, why has this vehicle changed locations? So I thought, when I'd run up towards the vehicle, make a mental note again of the registration. As I got to the vehicle, the, had the backs towards me and they were sat on the, the boot of the car, the hatchback of the vehicle. When I ran past and I got that glance and I did see, I did realise it was the same guy that I saw in the same location as well as the vehicle. I got to about 200 yards away when I heard a loud splash. It was obvious that something had been thrown into the water. One of the men PC Trick saw was Prevatelli, 
now locked up in Altrincham Police Station. The significance of that evidence from PC Trigg uh, was uh, crucial, really, I think, at that stage to the role that Prevatali had played in our ability to introduce evidence about Prevatali's role. We could then put Prevatali at a scene. We weren't quite sure where the scene was there or what was in the water at that time, but it was the next building block, if you like, to put in a case against Prevatali. Prevatelli answered no comment to virtually all the questions in the interview, but when we put two in the fact that he'd been seen throwing a bin into the canal, um, he admitted that he was there and he admitted that the fact that he'd helped some, his friend clean out the garage and was helping him dispose, fly tipping if you like, into the canal. Prevatelli's story didn't ring true. So why was he by the canal that day and who was the man with him? Detectives were about to get both those questions answered in dramatic fashion. We'd all been on duty for quite a considerable amount of time. We were getting nothing from the interviews. We had no more evidence or intelligence that we had when we went to the address in the morning. And we were really starting to think about where we're going to bail these people, we're going to release them, what's the next step? And then we get told about an email from America. When I read the email, it was one of those uh, eureka moments, I guess. I think that's the best way to describe it. The email was sent from a man in America called Sean, and his evidence was to provide a crucial breakthrough. Sean regularly visited the same S&M chat rooms on the internet that were used by Tracy Seward and her fans, and had come across disturbing accounts of the brutal murder of an Englishman called Philip Brierley. Was it a sick fantasy, or could it be true? I had an account of what had happened to Philip, and what he wanted to, that I was looking to do, was to see whether there's any substance to the, the bizarre account that he'd had. So he'd been looking in local publications uh, in England on the internet for whether Philip Brierley was in the press as a a reported missing person. There were no newspaper reports about Philip Brown, so Sean then contacted a number of different British police forces to see if they knew whether a crime had really been committed. He didn't know whether Philip really had been murdered, although he'd been told he'd been murdered. And really, I think he was after reassurance that what he'd been told over the internet was going to be pure fantasy. Sean told detectives that according to the account on the internet, Philip Briley had been killed, dismembered, and his body parts had been covered in cement. Sean had something more, the name of one of the people involved in the gruesome murder plot. Sean mentioned to us quite a lot of the detail of, of what he had heard uh, had happened to Philip. Uh, and, and clearly, and most interestingly, uh, at that stage, I guess, he introduced the name Chris. Sean told us that Chris was a night watchman in a local disused garage. Sale in Altrincham is a pretty um, small area where there are not that many disused garages, and when we put that out to the team, they immediately put it together as Chris Cassidy. Chris Cassidy was a friend of both Tracy Seward's and Philip Riley's. Chris Cassidy struck me as an unusual character. He, he'd become very close to Seward's daughter, and she used to call him Dad. But it was clear that the magnetism of Seward that led him to become involved. Chris Cassidy. Uh, had, had come across the officers at the time when they were searching uh, Tracy's home address and was somebody who immediately arose suspicion in the officers that he knew something about what had taken place. They remember him being very panicky, being very unsettled, but, but rather than avoiding the police, he seemed to want to engage with the police as if almost trying to find out what the investigation was doing and where it was going. The reason for Cassidy's curiosity was about to become clear. Police investigating the disappearance of 42-year-old Philip Briley from Sale in Manchester had just received vital information in an email from America. It led them to arrest a night watchman called Chris Cassidy and search his home. The most significant item found at his home, which really excited us, was a receipt from a local builder's merchant for some uh, cement. Uh, and the date uh, of the purchase of that was, was in the week uh, immediately. Uh, following Philip's disappearance. The receipt led detectives to a builder's yard near Cassidy's home, and the staff there remembered him and his rather odd behaviour. He came in and looked like a jobbing builder. He uh, asked for rapid set cement, plastic sheeting and gaffer tape. There was actually two purchases of, of cement that Cassidy had done, and in particular the builders' merchants, remember, they bought one lot and then the same day they'd rang up in panic wanting another lot, just as the, the, the merchants were about to close. 
and they'd, they'd almost pleaded with them to stay open. The reason he gave that he was coming back was he'd run out of um, cement and he needed to finish the job that day. I got the cement ready and put it by the gate and he didn't turn up till about ten past five. We took the money off him. He, he wouldn't bother about the money. He let us keep the change and everything. Cassidy couldn't give us any truthful or viable reason why he would want that cement in such extreme panicky circumstances and that line of inquiry was, was really putting pressure on him. Cassidy had an anxious wait as sceptical detectives began to check further into his unconvincing excuses. Cassidy hadn't been able to sleep at night. He was really troubled by what had happened and he wanted to get this off his chest. Through him and his solicitor, we got an agreement from him that he would take us out then and there, uh, take out the officers to the scenes where he uh, would indicate to us where Philip's dismembered body had been placed. Cassidy said he was going to take us to um, Sale Water Park. He was going to identify the place where the body had been thrown into the river. So we set off in about three motor vehicles. The first ones um, with police officers in, the second one with Cassidy in with a police officer, um, the solicitor was in there as well, and I was following behind in the rear car. We went down to Sail Water Park, which is kind of a rural place, and eventually we all turned into a, a place near the river and everybody gets out. He took us to the side of the, the Bridgewater Canal and indicated to us, in brief terms, this is where he put the parts of Philip's body that he'd disposed of. Clearly, what was going through my mind then, you know, was this a genuine account we got from Cassidy, OK, taking us out and showing us things, he told us things. We had other accounts, but until such time as you got a, uh, some evidence of what had taken place, it was still only a story. <laughs> To find out if Cassidy's story was genuine, Greater Manchester Police's underwater search team were called in. We were to meet down at the canal bank in Sale the following day where underwater search unit divers were going to look for a body. To be honest, we didn't know whether we were going to find anything. We had lots of brickwork down there. As you can appreciate all the brickwork around here, all the, during the construction of all this, um, there was lots of extra bricks and boulders and things. So we were searching with our hands, uh, more or less patting as, as you go along. If the diver actually indicates a find and it's what you're looking for, it's, it's, it's a real surprise. When the first piece of concrete came, came up, the diver indicated a find. I got it to the side, um, and we had the forensic team there, and I got it out of the water with their help. Placed it on a piece of plastic that we'd, we had at the side of the bank. It was as if it was a sculptor's pre-modelling moulded bit of clay, if you like. Turned it over and inside was what looked like a part of a human limb. I think it was the bit I found, which was uh, indeed the head. It was like a, a circle, if you like, or a sphere with sloping shoulders. Uh, I think ultimately it was found that there was indeed a head inside. And that was the point at which we were able as a team then to think, OK, this is, uh, you know, we've got, we've got something we can really work with now. Cassidy's story seemed to be stacking up. He'd incriminated himself, but refused at this stage to tell police who else was involved in the murder plot. We're in a position to charge uh, Cassidy with murder based on, on his initial account to us. We were only able to charge Prevotali at that stage with assisting an offender, and that was largely due to the evidence of PC Trigg, having seen him deposit stuff in the river. We were concerned, we were really concerned, after we had charged the first two, and as time went on, whether or not we would have enough to charge Tracy Seward. And we had to have meetings with counsel, we had to review evidence, um, and we also were really, really hopeful that Cassidy would eventually give us a statement, which he did. Chris Cassidy decided to tell the full story from the beginning. 
Tracy approached me as I was giving her a lift in the car. I was constantly having Tracy describe to me how bad life was with Phil. Tracy said she was being forced to make fetish videos for Phil. She asked me if I would kill Phil. The pressure from her became constant. Cassidy gave in to the constant pressure from Tracy and agreed that he would carry out the killing. She told him her young lover, Jonah Previtelli, would supply the murder weapon. Joni Previtelli contacted me, saying that he'd got a small handgun and that it looked like a toy. He'd also got 48 bullets for the gun and he said that it was a revolver. He'd bought a candle holder and he'd modified the bottom putting in a metal plate so that he could put the gun inside. Privatali told me that he would send the candle holder through the post to my home in sale, and that the gun would be inside. As they drove home from an evening at Philip's sister's house on the 11th of June 2001, Tracy Seward persuaded Philip that they should drop in to see their friend Chris Cassidy, who was on duty as a night watchman at a disused garage in Altrincham. I opened the door and they both came in. Phil asked if he could have a look around the workshop and I agreed. He left Tracy with me and I asked her if she still wanted it doing. She said, yes, it's the only way we will be free. As we walked into the rear garage area, Tracy fell. She was lying on the floor. Philip knelt down saying, come on Tracy, get up. I had taken the gun from my right pocket, and as his back was towards me, I fired one shot into the back of his head. I remember the loud bang. Philip brought his left hand to the back of his head, and he just looked at me as if to say, you bastard. When we got the statement from Cassidy, uh, the detail of it, which read like a novel in a lot of ways, pieced it all together, and we had the view from the inside of what was going on, and it made an enormous difference. Cassidy admitted shooting another three bullets into Philip's head. He said Seward then helped him roll the body up in plastic sheeting and put it into Briarley's car, which they drove back to Arnsby Avenue in Sale. The body stayed in the boot of the ordinary family car for two days, until Previtelli flew over from Switzerland to help them dispose of it. We believe that their plan was to bury the body, but Previtali was adamant that he was going to dismember the body. For some reason, he just wanted to do that. Whether it was his hatred towards Brearley, what it was motivating him, we don't know, but he found a disused saw in the garage, and he set up about sawing the body apart, chopped the head off, chopped the arms off, chopped the legs off, and then cut the torso in two, which was an incredibly gruesome way of disposing of a body. Jona cut through Philip's right shoulder to take off his arm. I started heaving, and I threw up in the showroom. Then came a moment when it seemed their carefully laid plans were about to fall apart when a police car drew up outside. After about an hour and a half of John soaring, as I stood in the showroom, I saw a police car pull onto the car park by the top entrance. Privatali came into the showroom saying what hard work it was, and I told him that the police were on the car park. But it turned out that the local police had arrived just to set up a speed trap and not to investigate the macabre goings on at the back of the building. Privatali saw the police and just shrugged his shoulders and went to carry on. To complete the grim ritual in a manner more suited to the Mafia, the two men bought quick drying cement from a builder's yard. They encased each of the body parts in the concrete and dumped them in what they hoped would be their final resting place. The police frogmen changed all that, but once they had recovered the concrete blocks, detectives still faced a major problem, how to carry out a proper post-mortem. What it prompted us to do was, was to try and find some equipment that could actually x-ray the concrete blocks to give us a start point, or to give the pathologist a start point in how to actually open out the, uh, the piece of cement. We actually got some equipment sent to us that had been used on the Rosemary West and Fred West murder investigation, some x-ray equipment that had been used there. It's a device which they use to uh, um, penetrate walls, an x-ray device, and to search behind walls searching for bodies or skeletons. We set the pieces of concrete in front of this detection device and they imaged 
through the concrete and the results that were produced were absolutely fantastic. The device was so powerful that police had to evacuate part of the area around the hospital mortuary because of potential dangers from the x-rays. You can actually see right through the concrete and in one of the pieces there were um, arms and legs. We also had a, a bin that was recovered in which there was part of the torso uh, of a body as well. And the strange thing was that when you looked at the actual x-ray images you could actually see the watch on the wrist, clearly see the watch on the wrist of um, the arm and in one of the other pieces you could see the shoes and you could actually read the name of the shoes because there was a metal, the, the name plate on the side of the shoes was made of metal and you could actually read the name. So it, it gave us a really good clue as to what was inside and the best way to go about trying to get them out of the actual pieces of concrete. Then the x-ray revealed something that was critical to the inquiry. We looked at uh, the, the bell-shaped piece of concrete which we, which which actually contained the head um, and the x-ray image revealed inside some dark, very small dark pieces um, and I think that everyone came to the conclusion that they were probably bullets uh, although we didn't know until we actually excavated, found them and had a look at them um, but it enabled us to see without even opening the piece of concrete what was inside and the fact that there were some very dense metallic objects inside which we thought were bullets. We actually brought a, a Kango hammer to the post-mortem, as well as an, uh, a range of sort of diamond cutting tools. In the end, um, because we knew where everything was, we were able to decide where we were going to make the cut and uh, open it up and, and reveal what was inside. Clearly what we had to do was make sure we had all the evidence recovered and through the, the process of x-ray, the lumps of concrete, managing to open the, the lumps of concrete, managing to, to conduct the post-mortem, we were satisfied that we would actually recovered all the parts of uh, Philip's body uh, and, and we were satisfied and, and uh, that we had done so. Chris Cassidy had already been charged with Philip's murder. Now detectives had enough evidence to also charge Jonah Privatelli. But Tracy Seward continued to try to convince those around her she was innocent. My memories of Tracy are just somebody who was in control. Um, somebody, uh, when I used to visit, I used to visit sort of without giving warning really so that I could see who was at the address when I arrived, if there were any cars parked outside that were unusual, if she received any telephone calls while I was there. Um, but she was very, not secretive, but very clever at um, allowing me to see what she wanted me to see within the house and then for me to go. Um, and I think the way she presented herself was just the grieving widow. Detectives were gradually piecing together the evidence that would shatter Tracy's carefully constructed image. The investigation really had to concentrate, part of the investigation to concentrate on the sequence of events that, that we could prove uh, and where Tracy fitted into those sequence of events and try and work out from that what evidence we could actually get. A large part of that was, was really looking at the sequence of phone calls uh, between Tracy and, uh, and Previtali uh, in Switzerland on the night that Philip was murdered. And it was that really that provided the breakthrough. We'd actually got that in, in, in evidence. We were able to then charge Tracy with murder. But there was to be one final twist in the tale. Even more damning evidence about Tracy's role was about to be revealed by another of her internet slaves. Police investigating the murder of 42-year-old Philip Riley from Cheshire were close to the end game. They had already charged Tracy Seward and two of the men she dominated with the police killer. Then they uncovered the role in the murder plot of another of Tracy's internet devotees, Roel Thomason. Our investigation concentrated on others who were part of the close network of Philip and Tracy, and, and we came across Raoul Thomason, a man who was living in Holland at that time. Thomason was a, a train driver in Holland who was an internet porn addict, this type of porn that uh, Tracy Seward um, cultivated. I, I think he too, in his own way, was infatuated with Tracy Seward. What made Roald Thomason's name stand out is that detectives found that he had sent money to Tracy Seward and was in constant touch on the phone. On one occasion, he called her 32 times in one day. It was clear from our investigation that Tracy had had a form of relationship with Thomason uh, and it was clear to us that Thomason was absolutely besotted with Tracy uh, and would do anything for her. 
he was uh, really close to the, the conspiracy, uh, had offered to help Tracy in the past to get rid of Philip by different means at different dates. Tracy Seward convinced Thomason that he was the object of her affections and that Prevatelli was no longer on the scene. He'd been involved in the planning of the murder in a lot of different ways, but hadn't actually taken part in the killing itself. So, for example, he'd sent over to England uh, sleeping pills, which were administered to Briley uh, unsuccessfully. He, he'd also planned to send over a sawn-off shotgun to be used in the killing, and he'd financed various aspects of the killing also. He agreed to come over and tidy up the murder scene after Briley had been murdered. In effect, he agreed to do all these things, but the final stage of coming over and clearing up, he found he couldn't, just couldn't do it. With Thomason's evidence and Cassidy's confession, the net had finally closed in on Tracy Seward. And on the day their trial was due to open, she and her lover, Jonah Prevatelli, admitted they were guilty of murder. Due a large part to the efforts of Chris Cassidy in giving us a statement, uh, and due to what I think was a, a really professional investigation that, that, that recovered evidence from five or six different countries in America, in Europe and in England, uh, they, uh, Cassidy, uh, Prevatelli and uh, Tracy Seward were in a position where they had no real uh, option but to plead guilty, which they did do so. When they all pleaded guilty, I took that as recognition that the case that the whole team had put together had been done in the most appropriate, meticulous and detailed way that left her nowhere else to go. After extradition from Holland, Roel Thomason, a slave, was sent to prison for eight years for his part in the crime. Jonah Prevatelli, the lover, was given a life sentence, as was Chris Cassidy, the man who actually pulled the trigger. Three men, their lives devastated by their involvement with Tracy Seward. Seward was a very cunning woman and she'd set up a trap that she led her husband into, to his death, at the disused garage. And I think she was keen to involve other people and was able to do that because she was such a powerful personality. She got three men to murder for her. And that has got to be an extreme example of dominating somebody, including somebody who had no background. In fact, none of them had any real background in criminality. None of them were murderers. None of them were violent people. And she managed to manipulate them to do this gruesome act. She used different techniques of manipulation to achieve her ends. For example, with Prevatelli, it was quite clear that uh, there was a full-blown sexual relationship. She was quite clearly using the sexual relationship as the basis on which to manipulate Prevatelli to behave in a particular way. With the Dutchman, Roel Thomason, he believed, for example, that Prevatelli was no longer on the scene, so she was withholding information from him as a way of manipulating him to behave in a particular way that she wanted. And then finally, you have Cassidy, who commits the murder, but is not interested in sadomasochism at all, but she presents herself to him as if she's an abused woman, and that he therefore can be the hero of the hour by wiping out the abuser Brearley. For Philip Brierley's family, the mystery of his disappearance may have been solved, but the pain of their loss will never go away. The family are still, I don't have the words angry, but for, you know, frustrated at what went on, disbelieving still in a way um, that this could have taken place. Philip's sister still recalls that moment that she last saw him, the, the happy family that she saw drive away that night. As for Tracy Seward, alias the Stiletto Goddess, she received a life sentence. The great manipulator finally couldn't scheme her way out of this one. I don't think she thought she could do the perfect murder, but I do think she thought she could get other people more blamed than her. I think she thought she could blame it on Cassidy and she could blame it on Roald Thomason and she could then disappear into the uh, evening sun with Prevatelli. It's quite clear, without the internet existing, Seward would never have met Prevatelli. The fantasy of uh, what used to be a furtive and secret world of sadomasochism moves out of fantasy and goes into reality. And again, I doubt if that would have happened had it not been for the way the internet propelled this group of people into taking that fantasy one step further, taking that fantasy into reality, a reality that led to somebody being murdered. Macclesfield, a quaint market town situated in the northwest of England. It's a very nice town to live in. 
you've got some very, very expensive areas where the property prices are sky high. An area. In 1985, 56-year-old Joan Bedison moved into the suburb of Macclesfield known as Broken Cross. I personally think that her whole life really revolved around her home. She was um, absolutely fastidious about the home. But the shy and retiring church-going spinster could never have imagined that one day she would become the target of a cruel and deceptive predator. Nobody knew Joan better than I, and how she come to be hoodwinked in this way. I, 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 to this day, cannot understand, I cannot grasp that. As Joan prepared for bed late on the evening of Thursday, the 14th of November, 2002, she received a telephone call. And although only two people knew what had been said, that conversation would change the lives of all involved forever. Following the death of her parents when she was in her teens, Joan Bedison was brought up by her uncle Norman and aunt Kath in Stockport, Cheshire. They didn't have any children of their own and I think they looked upon Joan as a daughter that they'd never had and uh, she was very, very happy living with them. They doted upon her, they looked after her and Joan reciprocated that love. She did everything for them. There was nothing was too much trouble for her. But when Aunt Kath passed away, Joan and her uncle Norman were left to look after each other. They developed a very close relationship. She uh, looked after Uncle Norman, and I think in many ways, she looked upon him as the father that she hadn't had for so many years. Their relationship was so strong that Joan never married or started a family of her own. As much as I think she would have liked to have met someone to marry, I don't quite think that anybody ever matched up to Uncle Norman. But when Norman passed away in 1984, Joan was alone again. Now that Norman had passed away, we rallied round her, and then she dropped the bombshell. She was moving to Macclesfield. When Uncle Norman left um, his estate to Joan, and with that money she then went on to purchase a bungalow in Macclesfield. Uncle Norman had always wanted to live there, and even though he died, I think she wanted to carry out his wishes. And I think that was a tribute, really. She, she did that, I think, in memory of her uncle. And she kept the house immaculate, just how Uncle Norman would have liked it. It was almost like walking back into the original home that they had in Lower Bredbury. It was the same furniture and the decor was exactly the same. I think the fact that she liked the home so immaculate was that when she'd lived with Uncle Norman, he, he was actually quite a stickler. And even though he died, I think she wanted to carry out his wishes. It was a way of fulfilling his dream and her dream. But little did Joan know that her attempt to live the life her uncle had always dreamt of would lead to heartbreak and tragedy. On Saturday, November the 16th, 2002, district nurse Catherine Dawson knocked on Joan Bedison's front door for the third time that day. Catherine was only calling to treat a minor ailment, but became increasingly concerned that her patient's condition was now far more serious and so she called for assistance. And when PC Keith Graham arrived, the district nurse showed him why she thought Joan had failed to answer the door. You could see through a bedroom window at the rear of this bungalow, there was a shape on a bed, so obviously there was concern there straight away. As PC Graham tried to find a way into the bungalow, he made a remarkable discovery. And it was this stage, I tried the patio door and he just slid open. Um, quite shocked really, um, pulled the curtains back and stepped inside the house. 
After entering the house, PC Graham carried out a brief search of the property before heading over to the bedroom. The first thing that struck me was there was static playing on the radio. You're hoping that it's just a pillow under the quilt rather than a person. But as soon as I got in there, I could see some feet. At that point, obviously, I realised that I was going to stumble across a body. What PC Graham had discovered was the dead body of Joan Bedison. She looked like she'd been dead a while as well. But how had Joan died? Were natural causes to blame, or could Joan have been the victim of an altogether more sinister scheme? On Saturday, the 16th of November, 2002, the body of 71-year-old spinster Joan Bedison was found by police officers at her home in Macclesfield, Cheshire. There was no obvious cause of death, but the police officer who'd found her was already suspicious. The patio doors were unlocked, and the positioning of Joan's body seemed peculiar. The fact that the quilt was pulled completely over the top of her, you know, which it just made you think that somebody had actually pulled it that way. And upon closer inspection, PC Graham had other concerns. She was cuddling a pillow, uh, and half of that corner of the pillow seemed to be lodged into her mouth. My first instinct was this is not right at all. Suspecting foul play, PC Graham requested CID officers to attend the scene. We looked through the house to see if there was anything overtly obvious in respect of a burglary, a struggle, blood, anything at all. There wasn't any obvious signs of somebody searching the property or any disruption at the property. And I was directed to the rear back bedroom where Joan was lying on the bed. And once they could see Joan Bedison for themselves, the detectives had to decide how to proceed. There are two options here. There's the option that she died of a natural cause. The other options are that there are inconsistencies at the scene. There are things that are troubling not just myself, but the other officers at the scene, and that this is a suspicious death. We made the decision that we would have to treat it in that way. We forensically recovered Joan's body, we photographed everything in situ, and we sealed the scene. The officers were then faced with having to tell Joan's only living relatives the news of her death. We didn't know what she died from. She was fine when we spoke to her a couple of days ago, but we didn't know. We didn't know what she died from. After identifying the body, Alf and Sue wanted to make sure Joan's house was secure. But when they arrived in the quaint suburban cul-de-sac, they were greeted with some surprising news from Joan's neighbour, Mrs Greenwood. The first thing that she said to my father when we sat down was, um, oh, thank God you've got the money back. And my father and I looked at each other and we said, what? What, what do you mean? And she said, you know, that, that money that um, Joan had lent that man, she told us you've got it all back. I just didn't know what they were talking about and I didn't want to show my ignorance in front of them because I was now getting bad thoughts. I said to my dad, this isn't right. I said, something just doesn't ring right. I said, I think we need to report what we've just been told. I said, it sounds like there's a possibility fraud has been committed. But the police were one step ahead of the family, and they too had already spoken to the Greenwoods. They highlighted to us a man that they knew as Crittenden, that, that had visited the property regularly, and that they'd become concerned about Joan because Mr Greenwood had seen an IOU, as he described it, for hundreds of thousands of pounds. Upon hearing of the neighbours' concerns, the detectives started to wonder if their inquiry into an unexplained death had uncovered another crime altogether. Subsequently, we went back to the scene to recover contact details for Mr Crittenden. The officers returned to the house and started to search the bungalow. I found a metal oblong box which was in the bottom of a wardrobe. And that box contained many documents concerning Joan's financial affairs. But there was one document in particular that stood out to Detective Constable Puchalski. What I found that it contained was a loan agreement between Joan Bedison and Peter Crittenden, her financial advisor. And the loan was for £270,000. And the rate of interest 
on the loan was 10% per annum that appears to be signed by them both at the bottom. But this wasn't the only significant document to be found in the house. We found near to the telephone, just underneath, a handwritten note which caused us great concern. Peter, I want to say something to you. I won't be seeing you anymore because it's upsetting me being deceitful and having to tell lies. I love you so very much, and it's best if it ends now, while we are still the best of friends. And the final part of the note was that she was asking for her money back. Quite clearly, that note that we found indicated that this was much more than a professional relationship with a financial advisor. At this point, the police were obviously giving us glimmers of information. For instance, they would say, did, did we know that this had been Joan's boyfriend? And we said, well, no, no. I'm sure she would have told us if there was a boyfriend. And the family were left even more confused when the following day, the post-mortem into how Joan died threw up more questions. We had a call from uh, the police to say that they were not satisfied with the post-mortem. So that then started to ring alarm bells. We quite clearly now had to be very careful on what steps that we took next. More and more, we had to consider the fact that this was a suspicious death. Whilst making inquiries into the unexplained death of Joan Bedison, detectives had become concerned with reports of unusual financial arrangements made in collaboration with her financial advisor and apparent lover, Peter Crittenden. We needed to look at their relationship. He could be the last person that saw Joan alive. So we, we clearly needed to speak to him and, and clarify these issues. But before the detectives could contact Peter, he presented himself to the police. We're down to first impressions. Very smartly dressed, suntanned, athletic looking, very well spoken, very well presented, very believable. Peter Crittenden explained that he was a financial advisor specialising in retirement and as a result earned approximately £70,000 a year based solely on commission. And whilst he admitted to being in a relationship with Joan, he was also happy to tell the police about his wife and their family. He did inform us that he was a married man living in Worcester with grown-up children. But I'm the police, I'm not the moral police. So I'm not going to make any judgments on that. Peter then went on to explain how he had met Joan back in October 2000. The story that he told to me was that Joan responded to an advert in The Times and as a result, he'd had a, a standard meeting, as he described it, which did a financial appraisal of Joan's current position. The notes that he'd made from that meeting showed that uh, Joan Bedison had a wealth of almost half a million pounds. But it was the third time they met in February 2001 that their relationship started to get more serious. This is his version of events, that on that meeting, they become romantically involved. They agree an action plan as to what she's going to do. And, th and this, this is breathtaking for me, is that the, the action plan involved her selling her house that she'd bought because of Norman's dream to retire to Macclesfield, sell all her investments, to invest in property, to invest in business ventures, and to make a new will. And he'd bullet pointed it on the file, that, that this is what she'd agreed to do. As part of Peter's eight-point action plan, Joan needed to sell her bungalow, and the following day, the couple visited a local estate agent to arrange a valuation. He somehow has a homemade will kit with him on this visit, and they ask two unknowing members of staff to sign this will. And it was the name of the beneficiary of the will that shocked the police. This will changes everything that we know about Joan. She's giving everything to this one man that she's met three times, Peter John Crittenden. But Peter was able to explain why Joan had agreed to such a dramatic restructure of her finances in such a short space of time. He wanted to emphasise that Joan saw this money as a burden to her and that she wanted to have a bonfire in the back garden 
and he sort of said, well, don't do that. We can do something better with your money than burn it in the back garden. Peter's revelations had amazed the investigating officers and left Joan Bedison's family stunned. This was so alien to Joan because um, from a frugal lifestyle of counting pennies and knowing exactly where her money was, suddenly to have got rid of it all, it was not right. We were absolutely in the dark. We thought we knew Joan. Within three months of meeting the elderly spinster, Peter Crittenden had taken full control of Joan's financial... 10% um, per annum interest, there was no um, information or there were no documentation to show that this 10% was coming Joan's way. Everything had been sold and channeled to Mr Crinton. Meanwhile, the matter of how Joan had died was still in question. And so a second post-mortem was carried out. The information that we were getting was that it was not absolutely conclusive at that time but that we were looking towards asphyxia. So again, we're not at a stage where we can conclusively say what's happened here, but another further element is put into the pot. With no cause of death confirmed, it became clear to the detectives that even after Joan had handed him a quarter of a million pounds, Crittenden was still putting pressure on her to sell her bungalow. But in November 2001, Joan was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and turned to her friends from the church. We knew about Joan's illness at church. There were people there that had been in the same boat. They'd had big operations and, you know, we all sort of rallied round and I think they were all amazed how well she came through the operation. And after leaving hospital, Joan went to stay at Dorothy's to convalesce. When Joan had been staying with us for about a fortnight, she said, I've done a silly thing. Um, I'd like to tell you about it. Joan went on to tell Dorothy all about how she had given her money away to her financial advisor. She seemed a bit angry, really, that the money had gone and she didn't know where it had gone to. When I heard this, I said, well, really, you should go to the police if you're not happy with it. And she said, oh, no, I don't want to be involved with the police and police cars at the door. Although Joan didn't want the police involved, she did take Dorothy's advice and decided to write a new will. Within weeks of recovering, she'd made an appointment to, to see a solicitor, uh, a local solicitor, and she'd gone about formally making a will and making sure that her family were the executors and the beneficiaries of her will, which is the Bedison family. On, on, the, on, the, on the first time we searched the property, I found that will and it quite clearly stated Joan's intentions. And I think it's the closest thing we've got to Joan's intentions prior to her death. Unfortunately, because of an error in the will, a technical error, she'd never signed it. However, even if Joan had signed the will, she would never have known that her desire to try and recoup her money would lead to tragedy. The police asked me, did I want them to officially investigate the possibility of fraud. And I said, certainly. And on Saturday, the 28th of March, 2003, four months after the death of Joan Bedison, Peter Crittenden was arrested for theft. But there were some questions that remained unanswered. It is a massive leap. The fact that he has acted in an irregular manner or may even have stolen Joan's money doesn't mean that he's a murderer. However, while sifting through Crittenden's personal files, Peter Puchalski made a discovery that would become a major turning point in the investigation. The phone rang and it was Peter over at Macclesfield looking at the documents and he just said, you're not going to believe what I found. Following the discovery of Joan Bedison's body in November 2001, police officers in Macclesfield, Cheshire, continued to investigate what had caused the 71-year-old spinster's death. Detectives had already uncovered a series of irregular financial dealings that suggested Joan had been the victim of fraudulent behavior by her financial advisor and lover, 
Peter Crittenden. After a four-month investigation, the detectives from Cheshire Constabulary were in a position to arrest Peter Crittenden for theft. But could the 62-year-old also be responsible for the death of his client? He admitted that the money had gone to pay off certain things or loans to certain people or invested in a franchise which was completely unsuccessful or invested in property which was not as he expected to be. And that's where his first difficulty arose. And now it was becoming difficult because he'd already spent the money. So at that stage, he had to start to describe it in different terms. He would describe this sum of money as a loan on, as an answer to one question. But then when it became apparent that that wouldn't suffice, he'd describe it as a gift. And when that became apparent that that wouldn't suffice, he'd describe it as a joint investment. And he was, he was very adept at adapting his answers to the, to the questioning. Detective Sergeant Thomas and Detective Constable Puchalski continued to interview Crittenden. And during a break, the officers decided to search Peter's personal effects and found a document that would prove vital to their investigation. I notice a decreasing term life insurance policy for Joan Bedison. The grantee was Peter John Crittenden, and the sum assured was £100,000. And this insurance policy was taken out around the time when Joan Bedison fell ill and suffered with cancer. And Peter Crittenden, most importantly, was paying the premiums on this. Usually taken out to cover mortgage repayments, the life insurance policy cost Crittenden £68 per month to maintain. This insurance policy decreases after year one from £100,000 to something like £85,000. And that assurance policy was due to decrease down to the lower level of £85,000 in January 2003, which is just two months after Joan's death. This particular document clearly revealed that Crittenden would substantially gain from the death of Joan Bedison if she was to die sooner rather than later. This was indicating that Peter Crittenden needed to act in some way before he lost everything, before he lost the whole estate, before he lost £100,000 on the insurance policy. I went cold because I thought it was a catalyst to show that we weren't dealing with just a thief here, we were dealing with a murderer. The motive is just overwhelming, really. I was in the uh, CID room upstairs at Wilmslow and the phone rang and it was Peter over at Macclesfield looking at the documents. And he just said, you're not gonna believe what I found. It felt a significant moment. And we both said to each other on the phone, we can't carry on just looking at the theft. This man now has to be a suspect in the death of Joan Bedison. But the possibility that Crittenden might not only be a thief, but also a murderer, meant that officers were unable to continue with their questioning. There is legally a point there at which I have to stop. I can't ignore that fact and I can't continue with the interviews as he's arrested for theft and, and those interviews have to stop and we have to reconsider what we've got and deal with the matter in a different way. The detectives had no choice other than to release Peter Crittenden whilst they re-evaluated the case. I think that's the only time I've seen him surprised. Faced with the facts that they'd had so far, is he'd given a version of events and he's bailed. Obviously his legal team and him were totally unaware of what's going on in the background. But not everyone was happy upon hearing the news of his release. I felt very vulnerable. There was really only my, my brother, dad, dad and I, and I, I was quite frightened. And Sue knew she was right to feel frightened when detectives revealed they had uncovered enough evidence to launch a full-scale murder inquiry. I remember coming to Macclesfield and myself and Pete were sat in front of a full room of detectives and forensic experts, all listening to what we had to say, all believing in what we were saying and all ready to, to follow up the inquiries and the actions that were being generated. The police started to re-examine every aspect of the case, starting with the crime scene. 
Part of the initial stages of the murder investigation was to forensically re-examine the scene. Was there anything that we'd missed? And to take it apart in terms of an evidential scene. The crime scene investigators re-examined the house, which had remained sealed off since Joan's body was discovered six months earlier. One of the crime scene investigators carefully looked at all the bedding, not only at Joan Bedison's bedding, but at the bedding in the guest room. This bedroom looked perfectly neat and tidy, and there was a flowery pink pattern on the pillows, but he managed to notice some blood on that pillow. And we sent that pillow and the pillow that was found near to Joan Bellison's face off to the lab to do a thorough forensic examination to give us an interpretation on the blood splatter splattering on both pillows. After extensive analysis of both pillows, the Forensic Science Service was able to make a major breakthrough in the investigation. Their findings were that the pillow in the guest bedroom had been used to overlay on top of the other pillow near to Joan's mouth, and that she had been smothered, and that her last gasp had caused a spray of blood. And this spray had sprayed over both pillows. This revelation also backed up the results of the second post-mortem, which had suggested that Joan might have been suffocated. However, the scientists also came to another important conclusion. Joan must have been murdered, because if Joan had died in that bed, who put the pillow back in onto the bed in the other room, the room that Peter Crittenden always slept in when he stayed over? With asphyxia now looking almost certain to be the cause of death, the detectives decided to carry out a third and final post-mortem. At this point, it had been suggested to us that she had been suffocated with a pillow and that the pillow had been pushed against her face, against her lips and her nose. And uh, they were looking at this post-mortem with a view to checking for bruising deep down in the tissues. The pathologist performed a microscopic examination of the tissue beneath the surface of the skin. What he found was that there was a bruising which would indicate that pressure had been brought to bear around the lip and nose area. This new information, together with the results of the previous post-mortems and the forensic reports, proved that Joan had been suffocated, and at last the family was starting to get their questions answered. In one respect, we felt pleased that we, we were getting to the bottom of things, getting to know what the cause of death was. Um, but, but also, it was a horrific cause of death. I was relieved that at last the police had something definitely to work upon, that I hadn't wasted their time. But the shock of it, the horror, that it could happen to a lovely person, a quiet, shy person like Joan. Beggar's belief. Meanwhile, as police officers continued to trawl through the mountains of documents seized from Crittenden's office, they came across another client whose circumstances were nearly identical to those of Joan's. We had identified uh, an elderly lady who was um, a client of Peter's 12 years ago. Crittenden's documents revealed that the client had given him over £130,000 to invest. And like Joan, she hadn't received any return on her money. They were both females in their 60s. They were both on their own. They both had large amounts of uh, cash to invest. And they would both, you could say, vulnerable. It appears from her client file that he gave her similar investment advice and, and similar bullet points. Sell your home, move near to me in Worcester. But unlike Joan, the client did follow Crittenden's suggestion and moved house. Remember back to that checklist that he has. She moves from Wales to where Peter Crittenden lives, exactly like he'd written with Joan about their agreed action plan. The similarities were too striking to ignore. The key issues were there. Although the discovery of this new prosecution witness reinforced the possibility that Crittenden might have deceived Joan to steal her money, the police needed more evidence to implicate their prime suspect in her murder. 30 police officers, together with experts in forensics and pathology, continued to examine every minute detail of evidence, 
and started to see discrepancies in Peter Crittenden's alibi. He said that he had been up to visit Joan on the Tuesday before she was found on the Saturday. They'd been out that night for a meal at the Bridge Hotel in Presbury, which is a very nice restaurant. They returned home and they'd stayed in the double bedroom um, and that he'd had breakfast with her the next morning and then left to go back to Worcester. He said his last contact with Joan was obviously uh, when he'd left her that day. However, when Crittenden's telephone records were scrutinised, the detectives noticed something suspicious that might identify when Joan was murdered. We discovered that um, late on Thursday evening, sometime after nine, nine o'clock, uh, Peter Crittenden's mobile rang Joan Bedison for three minutes. He'd not previously mentioned this, and, and, and we were confused with that. It was a three-and-a-half-minute conversation. So he'd obviously made contact that night with Joan Bedison. Now, we know from inquiries with uh, neighbours that the curtains had been left drawn on the Friday, but it wasn't until the Saturday that nurses actually visited the uh, house. So that left us with possibility that something had occurred on the Thursday night into Friday morning. And when the investigating team cross-referenced this information with Crittenden's bank records, they made another startling discovery. One of the documents we recovered from himself, which was confirmed by his credit card transactions, was that he had made a purchase of petrol in the early hours, just after midnight, of Friday the 15th of November 2002 at Blackpool service station. Crittenden told police he was in bed with his wife in Worcester on the night Joan was murdered, but with his alibi now in question, the police needed to trace his movements once he left the petrol station. One of the officers involved in the case knew of a highways agency system of cameras that cover the M5 and M6 area and we found that 10 minutes after filling up with petrol, Peter Crittenden's number plate is registered on an ANPR camera on the M5 traveling north. And four hours later, Crittenden's car was registered again 150 miles away. The car is recorded in the Staffordshire area on the M6 traveling south. This new information directly contradicted Crittenden's alibi and gave police evidence that he had instead driven 400 miles to Jones' home in Macclesfield and back. After a seven-month investigation, the team felt they were finally in a position to present their case to their prime suspect, Peter John Crittenden. All those bits of evidence had come to light over a period of time. It's easy to summarise them quickly, but that had taken extensive investigation to, to recover all those bits of investigation. They didn't just fall into our laps. And on June the 6th, 2003, Peter Crittenden was arrested for a second time. But would he admit to the murder of 71-year-old spinster Joan Bedison? I was not surprised at all when the police said that they suspected that not only had fraud been committed, but that a more serious crime had been committed. And obviously the more serious crime could only be one thing, and that was the murder of Joan Edison. Following an investigation into the brutal murder of Joan Bedison, police officers had arrested her financial advisor and lover, Peter Crittenden. The detectives started to question their prime suspect by revealing the evidence they had collected during their seven-month investigation. And they started by asking Crittenden about the phone call he made to Joan on the night of her murder. His explanation was that he couldn't remember that conversation, he couldn't remember that phone call. And, and what we were saying was, that if this is somebody that you loved, somebody that, that you're about to inherit all their wealth, you're about to be the executor of their will, and you can't remember the last conversation that you had with this person. The officers then presented the suspect with evidence that directly contradicted his alibis. He's supposed to be at home in bed with his wife, but we could prove that he'd made a purchase of fuel at 
just after midnight from Blackpool service station, which is just off the M5. Key piece of information. Do you remember that? Where were you going? So, of course, this is now. He's now been caught out. So his explanation was then that, yes, he did pop out to fill his vehicle up, but then he'd returned home and gone to bed. However, it was the information collected from the highways agency that caught Crittenden off guard. So he's supposed to be heading back towards home, but we can place his vehicle, his registration, going the other way, travelling up the M5 motorway north within a few minutes of just purchasing fuel. And I remember when we revealed that evidence to him, that was the first time I ever saw emotion with him. It quite clearly disturbed him. That was something that he had not anticipated whatsoever and fell outside of his comfort zone. And I remember when we came back into the room once the, he'd had an opportunity to digest the information that we'd given to him, and you could clearly tell that he was distressed and that he looked as if he'd been crying. He knew that we'd got evidence that was going to convict him of murder. Despite the display of emotion, Crittenden astonishingly refused to admit he had driven his car that night. But he hadn't reported his car stolen and was unable to give any other explanation as to how it had twice been recorded travelling on the motorway on the night Joan was murdered. He always has denied that he was the driver of that vehicle and that he wasn't on the motorway that night. He says that after filling up with fuel, he returned to his home address, which quite clearly wasn't the case. Faced with such overwhelming circumstantial evidence, the police believe they finally had enough proof to prosecute Peter Crittenden. And so he was then charged with the murder of Joan Bederson. In addition to murder, Peter Crittenden was also charged with theft. For Joan's family, there was a great sense of relief. I felt elated. For myself, my family, and for the police because I knew that it had been one of the most difficult cases. I kind of felt a sense of, at last, at last something's happened. Um, obviously, I, I went straight up to my father's, told him, and by then, I think it had sunk in a little bit more that, yes, that there is this man out there that they strongly suspect is guilty. And on Tuesday, May the 11th, 2004, 18 months after Joan's death, the case came to trial at Chester Crown Court, where the accused pleaded not guilty. The first time that I saw Peter Crittenden, I could see what Joan had seen in him. She went for jackets, ties, presentable, and that was what he was. But Crittenden soon made his presence felt. He was quite patronising to the jury. He was pointing at them. Um, he tried to belittle people and once or twice he lost his temper, um, which obviously then showed another side to him. Not once in that box did that man show any remorse for the dreadful deed that he'd carried out. Crittenden continued to dismiss the evidence, but detectives now believe they knew exactly how Joan had met her death and presented the jury with their interpretation of the events leading up to the murder. I believe that Peter came on the Tuesday and met Joan and went out for a meal with her and stayed the night. But his, his plan had been hatched. He had unlocked the patio door so he could gain access into the house and then he returned home and I believe he made a final phone call on the Thursday night to make sure that Joan would be there, fill the car up with petrol and travel down on the early hours of the Friday morning, crept through the rear door, went to the guest bedroom and got the pillow. I believe he's wandered in and then smothered her with both pillows. Peter Crittenden, although he's 64, he keeps fit in the gym and he was far too strong for Joan Bedison. She was in her 70s and she was no match to fight Peter Crittenden off. And having achieved his objective, the police believed Crittenden then returned home and got back into bed with his wife. However, 
When interviewed, she claimed that she was asleep and could neither confirm nor deny his alibi. The case was debated for over seven weeks and eventually the jury was sent to deliberate. And after another two days, they returned with their verdict. We were just so nervous because we just didn't know what was going to happen. The spokesman stood up and they said guilty. And we, we were just, I don't know, we were drained. We were absolutely drained, um, but relieved. On Thursday, the 1st of July, 2004, Peter Crittenden was given a life sentence for the murder of Joan Bedison, the 71-year-old spinster who entrusted him with her most precious possessions, her money and her love. Although he continues to maintain his innocence, detectives were able to uncover substantial evidence that proved that Peter John Crittenden had the motive and opportunity to both steal from and then murder his client and lover, Joan Bedison. Mr. Crittenden is a totally and utterly convincing character. He groomed Joan. He knew what buttons to press, and he convinced her to do things that I think, fundamentally, she knew were wrong. But in Joan's defence, she, anybody would be convinced by Mr. Crittenden. One good thing has come out of this dreadful period, and that is that this man has been taken off the streets and no longer can he take money off gullible, lonely people. I think Joan initially loved Peter. Um, I'm sure she was taken in by him. I don't think he loved her. How can he have loved her? He murdered her. <laughs> Imagine a family without a care in the world, but on the brink of disaster. It's 1988, and the Harrells from Caerphilly, South Wales, have every reason to be happy. Their daughter and their younger son have a new sister, Natalie. We were all very surprised and we were all very excited at the fact that there was a new little baby in the house. Um, it was even better for me because it was a little sister. The age differences was uh, nine and four, so it was, it was just right to have another baby, and everything was perfect. But everything wasn't perfect. 200 miles away at Newton Le Willows in Lancashire lived someone who, for entirely separate reasons, coveted a baby. She was a woman who displayed bizarre behavior involving babies over several years, and she was about to encounter Natalie. There are people out there in society who have no empathy for their fellow human beings, and they will do anything if it pleases them. And that, to me, is a very frightening thought. It's April 1988, and baby Natalie Harrell is four months old and doing well. Very placid, very easy going. Uh, she's getting quite a character. She's pretty good at sleeping and settling down. Um, yeah, she was quite a good baby. I wanted to be um, basically a mother role to Natalie. Um, I used to generally just take care of her. I used to play with her toys and, you know, try and encourage her to talk. Generally, everything, you know, a doted sister would do, basically. The Harrells were planning a holiday, but their happiness was about to be wrecked. In Preston, Lancashire, a woman who liked to call herself Adelia, though it wasn't her real name, hired a car to drive to Wales. She was planning a crime which would shatter the lives of the family. Delia's case is one of those examples of, of someone with a kind of history of, of pathological behaviour, somehow interacting with a family who were least expecting it. Over the following days, she used Barclays cash dispensers in Cardiff and Pontypridd six times. But for the man who led the subsequent police operation, 
she left few other clues to her movements. We know that she stayed in the city centre for a few days and I think that she probably used that time to prowl the city centre, getting to know the lie of the land. Where she slept, where she stayed, we don't know. Possibly she slept rough in her car. What is known is that some days after arriving in Cardiff, there was an incident which foreshadowed the events which were later to unfold. Adelia approached a shopper. Oh, lovely baby, she's lovely. Can I hold her? No, Sarah. No. The Harrells, including baby Natalie, arrived in Cardiff to shop for their holiday. I can remember just starting, getting off the train, and more or less skipping up this long tunnel here. I can remember it being so long, um, and you know the anticipation, to, you know, to, and the excitement to go shopping was, you know, something that we didn't generally do in Cardiff. No, but I, I just loved shopping, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Natalie was in the prom, and, and she she really enjoyed days like this. She tended to be the type of child that just wanted to be in the outdoors, and she loved being in a prom. She loved being with with us, didn't she? Not far away, at around this time, Adelia entered a food outlet and asked for hot water for a baby flask. She was wearing a bin liner on her head, cut into the shape of a scarf. The Harrells were working their way round the shops, including a Littlewood store, now taken over by Next. At some point in the afternoon, Adelia began following them. Eventually, they headed back to Queen Street Station. We just finished shopping, I came through the doors here, um, and suddenly from behind I was approached by a, a woman. Excuse me, madam, excuse me. She said, have you just been shopping in Littlewoods? And I said, yes. And she said, um, well, I've been sent to get you because your oats have changed. I'm the uh, store detective there. You don't really the look manager's right. just sent me to tell you that you've, you've left some change. You've left some change. Well, I looked oh, at her at this point and I thought, who is this strange and peculiar woman? I can remember looking up at her and thinking, Oh, something doesn't seem right, I don't know. She, you know, she was, you know, quite scruffy in the way she looked, wasn't she? she yeah, was... and I said to her then, I, I need to sort this out, I will come back with you, but I, I don't think there is a problem, but then I went back to the store with her. Which I wasn't very happy with because of the fact that I wanted, you know, I had to go back into Cardiff, um, you know, just wanted, just to, get wanted to get home and open, you know, the clothes that we bought that day, basically. Oh, you're beautiful, aren't you? That's a beautiful then. baby. I really thought in the back of my mind, does she think I'm a shoplifter or something like that? Why, do, why is she questioning me? Because I even showed her my receipt and I, I knew that I wasn't owed anything, but in the back of my mind, I wanted to make sure that I was um, not accused of anything. What happened next was cleverly planned. What you've got to imagine is um, we were at the bottom, it all happened at the bottom of an escalator, very similar to the one that we're standing on here. Um, obviously not the same one as the store because the store no longer is, exists. So we were standing here at the bottom. Um, and the woman said to me, uh, you go upstairs and sort out the problem because that's where the, the problem is upstairs. Obviously you can't take the push chair on the escalators, but it's just up here to the right. They'll be expecting you to go and get into the Leave her with me, it's fine. So I got on the escalator with Kevin, left um, Natalie in the push chair with Louise holding the push chair with the woman. So when obviously the, I was looking up the escalator at my mum um, and the woman said to me, as soon as my mum was out of sight, um, you, your mum's calling you. So I said, I, I didn't hear anything, so I hesitated. Oh, I just heard your mum calling me. Yeah. Will you be a good girl, go see what she wants? No, be fine, don't worry. I'll look after her, good girl. You go find your mum, that's a good girl. I thought, oh no, what's going on? Because the way she pushed Natalie away just wasn't right. So I went up the rest of the escalator, come back down, and you've, you've got to imagine there was a, a stairs here. Um, so I come all the way down the stairs, running frantically through the store, and she was nowhere to be found.
as you can imagine, being you know a small child, all the clothes and every you know the store, everything was just uh, so much bigger, and the clothes it was so much higher. It was like a maze, and I couldn't find my way out. An eyewitness saw Adelia fleeing, almost overturning the pushchair on some steps. I think she'd calculated her entrance, where she wanted to position us by the escalator and her exit, which we later found out, was um, at the back entrance of the store. Meticulous planning is a core aspect of infant abduction. You have to think of a scenario, you have to think of the situation in which you're going to do it, you have to think about what you, how you're going to present yourself and what you're going to say. Now, ideally, of course, pretended to be a store detective. She had worked as a store detective, so she would know something about the, the, the rules and the, the content of how you approach people. Whilst Adelia escaped into the city centre, Maggie and Louise were held at the store for questioning by managers till police arrived. You just wanted to get out of that room and you just wanted to be thinking, why are they keeping me in here? Why don't you just help me search? Why don't you believe me? Very, very frustrating. Adelia was just 300 yards away. Five minutes after the abduction, she was seen by an eyewitness in the toilets of a multi-storey car park. When she went through the door of the toilet, there was a pushchair blocking her way. She then saw a woman bending down in one of the cubicles over the toilet and she thought it very unusual. And she thought at the time that the woman was doing something with her hair. She'd removed the headscarf and apparently put a wig on which made her look about 10 years younger. Maggie was meanwhile being taken to the police station for several more hours questioning. Why weren't they looking? You've got to look. You're missing valuable time. You've got to start looking. If, if they'd searched straight away and cordoned off, say, an area, then they might have found us straight away. I know that it upsets families, but unfortunately, that is the way it must be done. It's essential that we get our facts straight, and therefore it was very important that we verified Maggie's movements from the time that she left her home in Caffili until the time she went into Cardiff, went around shopping, and did what the things that she had to do. The eyewitness who'd seen Adelia in the toilets returned a few hours later. The toilets were empty, and the pushchair was still in the toilet. She reported this to a car parking attendant who was then able to tell her there'd been a baby snatch in the city and that is how we recovered the push chair. It was only through finding the push chair that they started to believe my story. I thought, my God, where has she gone? It was just utter despair. You, you just can't describe it. It was just like a proper nightmare. Police had a few eyewitness descriptions, but after finding the push chair, the trail went cold. No one could know where Adelia would take Natalie or what she'd do with her. Nor that the truth which brought this woman to Cardiff was every bit as extraordinary as the events that unfolded there, even to those closest to her. I was about to discover the truth about the woman that I'd married. The encounter between the Harrells and the woman who was to abduct four-month-old Natalie in 1988 took only a few minutes, but it had its roots in a pattern of bizarre behaviour stretching back years. In the mid-80s, Adelia was single, in her 40s, and had a twin obsession of getting pregnant and getting a man. In terms of the profile of people who do infant abductions, there are quite a few cases of women in their 40s engaged in this kind of behaviour. And some people have tried to link it to the menopause and the fact that they're getting to the end of their own childbearing age. What's most important is satisfying your own psychological needs. And those psychological needs are, are of two different types. One need is the kind of internal need, and it's normally thought of as a kind of compensation for loss. You've lost a child with a stillbirth or a miscarriage, or you can't have children any longer, or it's about maintaining or trying to maintain a relationship with a partner. Adelia had become the partner of someone who knew a great deal less about her than he thought. When they'd met, he'd been single, nearly 50, and they'd had unprotected sex on their first night. He agreed to be interviewed for this film, provided his words were performed by an actor. I first met Adelia at a dance in Chester. Uh, she ended coming back to spending the weekend. At the end of it, I said I thought we weren't really compatible. So. She just screamed off in a sports car. 
I'm Catholic, so I didn't use protection. About three weeks later, I received a call from Adelia saying that she wanted to meet up with me. What's all this about? She didn't say anything. She just handed me a letter. She said she was pregnant. OK, look, I, I, I don't want you to worry. I'll look after you. I'll look after the baby. All right. I mean it. I'm not that type of a fellow. I just walked away. For a time, the relationship felt normal and relaxed. The couple spent weekends together at his house. But then came a phone call. Delia. What? You've lost our babies. Babies? I mean, what she was saying was that she'd lost twins. I didn't even know she was expecting twins. It's just devastating. Hi, darling. Sorry I'm late. Like, back at work. Two months later, Adelia announced she was pregnant again. I was getting a bit of leg pulling at work, you know, these pregnancies coming so soon, one after the other. You have to start buying stuff soon. But a short time later, she again said she'd miscarried. I suspect she was uh, inventing these pregnancies to get me to marry her. But we're already living together as man and wife. I mean, I was giving her money for food, clothes, you know. And then I discovered that she changed the name by depot to mine without even asking me. Adelia's attempts to deepen the relationship were to become increasingly bizarre. The behaviours are all to do with manipulation, deceit, a kind of protracted pathological lying, a kind of manipulation of other human beings and a lack of empathy. So this is someone who is very much bound up with herself, puts herself first and cares first and foremost, first and foremost about her own psychological needs. Those needs led her to make a request which later was to suggest her mind was deeply disturbed. She asked me for something strange, Lincoln Continental. And I bought it. Adelia, for the third time, declared she was pregnant. She developed a swollen stomach, but there was no other evidence a baby was present. You know, it'd be nice to feel, feel you know, keep her own. Adelia's pressure to force her partner into marriage became increasingly explicit. That man was right. What man? A man from the Samaritans. You didn't go out of the Samaritans. He said if you were a decent man, you'd make a decent woman out of me. Oh, he did, did he? Yeah. I thought, she's already taken my name, she's carrying my child, so I thought, I'll book the marriage ceremony, and we went ahead. And all through the ceremony, for no reason that I could see, she was laughing hysterically. <laughs> I was just so happy about the child. Adelia said that Tess had confirmed it was going to be a girl. So we decided to call her Heidi. I was just so excited. So I went buying cots and prams and so on, you know. We even looked for combs and cups and trinkets with Heidi printed on them. But three days after the wedding, Adelia telephoned her new husband. I'm <laughs> She said she'd fallen down some concrete steps and there was no fetal heartbeat, so she was going to have the dead baby removed. Adelia! Adelia! When I got home, the house was empty. There was no message, no phone call, nothing whatsoever to explain where she was. I was desperate. I ended up phoning the police to report her missing. It seemed she'd left him. She did finally come home and uh, I rang the police to tell them. They came to interview her and eventually she admitted she'd never been pregnant and only said that she was to keep me.
was so upset and hurt by the charade that she'd put me through. It was at that point that I realised she was mentally ill. So I decided to do a bit of research. He discovered Adelia had been married three times before. The first husband, a merchant seaman, left her, though they had two children. The second appeared to have divorced her before dying, partly through alcohol abuse. But then came a revelation relating to the third husband, which cast new light on Adelia's request for a Lincoln Continental. She told me that he died of an heart attack. In fact, the husband was found in a Lincoln Continental with a pipe attached to the exhaust. He'd committed suicide. Before you know it, she's on to the police saying, I want the car back. Well, the police are saying, you know, it's full of vomit and fumes, but she's there demanding. So she gets it back and before you know it, she's driving around again in it. What you have to try and work out is what a Lincoln Continental symbolises for her. Well, at one level it symbolises wealth and so on, and the fact that she gets someone to buy it for her inflates her self-esteem because, you know, she's powerful enough to get men to buy this car for her. But why wouldn't she be put off if her husband had committed suicide in it? Well, perhaps the reason is that if someone's committed suicide, perhaps, again, it reflects on her own concept of identity. Perhaps she is that powerful that people will do all sorts of things out there for her. Her husband's patience had run out, and he left her. He did return after three weeks, but tensions deepened. Adelia was letting the house slip. At about this time, she did try to get work. She obtained a government grant to set up a private detective agency and offered her services as a store detective, but she put decreasing effort into her marriage. Our relationship deteriorated. Then things really came to a head. Shirley, please, you don't call me back. Oh, he's attacking me. He's attacking me. He's hurting me. Please, Shirley, come. Shirley, you've got to come now. Please call me. I couldn't believe it. She was telling our neighbour that I was attacking her. When I went through to take the phone off her, no, no, well, me. I realised that she wanted me to no, wrestle the no, phone away from her. I was arrested and put in a police cell. The charges were quickly dropped, but while I was there, the sergeant told me something unbelievable. Adelia had claimed, while she was still going out with me, that she was the mother of a baby abandoned at Harrods and she wanted to claim it. From her husband's point of view, of course, these are completely contradictory behaviours. And it's a classic double bind situation, which is both approach and avoidance. She's trying to pull him in, at the same time she looks as if she's trying to drive him away. So he will have understood that his wife at this point is not being a sane human being. By that time, I had had enough. I filed for divorce. Abandoned by her husband, Adelia had no intention of remaining on her own. Eight months after their split up, she embarked on her desperate trip to Cardiff and to the fateful encounter with the Harrells and four-month-old Natalie. May the 2nd, 1988, and four-month-old Natalie Harrell was in the clutches of Adelia, who had abducted her. Her family and police had no idea of Adelia's identity or what she was to do with her captive. I always remember at the time that the, who I now know as the Chief Superintendent of South Wales, John Williams, he came up to me and he said, I give you my word, this person thinks she's clever, but believe me, we get her back. That evening, Adelia brought Natalie to her home at Newton Le Willows in Lancashire. Of course, I couldn't sleep that night once I got in, um, wondering what had happened and what was going to happen. But I basically stayed awake all night. Police cast their net nationwide. 
it was a matter of saying, is this baby still in the Cardiff area? Is it in South Wales or is it in the UK? These were days before widespread CCTV footage was available. Obtaining a good description of Adelia was vital. Did she have, like, stereo eyes or long eyelashes like that? Louise helped police put together a photo fit. So she had eyelashes pretty much like that, really. I can remember looking through books and books of different eyes, different noses, different mouths, chins, hair, and then I had to put the photo fit together from what I could remember. There was little forensic evidence to go at. Using the photo fit and press briefings to appeal to the public was the central tool of the investigation. The media were massively important. We understood from the very beginning that they can reach parts that the police can't, and therefore we made a conscious decision to use them as much as possible. And we give every interview we could give, and we give every story, and we tried our best to keep on the front pages. The story quickly caught the public imagination dominating the news. I think some stories about abduction really take hold of us all, like the Madeleine McCann story, because of the way they grab us, because we empathise with the parents. You know, we've all been in that position. You know, we've all left our children for a few moments or a few minutes. And I think whenever you imagine yourself in that situation, it sets up a psychological bond between you and the victims. And I think you genuinely care about the outcome of the whole thing. Responses to the coverage began flooding into the incident room. Each needed checking out. We received hundreds of calls, and I don't think there was a police force in the country that wasn't carrying out an inquiry for us. At the outset, this appeared to be something of a maternal nature and not malicious. We therefore appealed, and we said that the baby had to be fed every three hours and was partially on solid food. I then appealed to everybody, mostly women, who would have empathy with the family, who did somebody come home with a baby they shouldn't have? Was somebody living above them more active with a child? Louise and Maggie were left coping not only with a sense of loss, but guilt. I felt angry with myself. I felt, why, did I, why was I so stupid? I'd basically said the most awful thing to her, which I will always regret. I said, you didn't let that woman take our baby. Well, of course, I was in such a state. I said, oh my God, I said, I'm sorry I've said that. I didn't mean that. That was my first thoughts, accusing, which was totally wrong to a nine-year-old. I was the mother. I was the one in charge of that child. It should have been me. I should have done more for Natalie, being the responsible one that I always was. I, you know, my mum would leave me, you know, and say, right, you can feed, you can feed your sister, you can change a nappy, you know. Like I, I took on the motherly role. I sort of felt responsible that I should have taken better care. To have uh, allowed that to have happened, I felt a failure. And sometimes when I think back now, I think I was a failure as a, as a mother. Um, but I had to get myself over that. The police inquiry was massive. We had upwards of 50 to 60 detectives from South Wales working on it, and of course the rest of the country through the media were well aware of what was going on. But the family could do no more than wait for news. It's a sense of hopelessness. No matter what we did, we couldn't do much. But the lowest I got was three days after Natalie went missing, about ten past six. The phone rang and I answered it. Hello? And it was uh, a woman who just said that um, she's dead. Everybody was looking at me, expecting good news, and I, I just broke down, and it's the first time that uh, I cried. I had to go into the kitchen. My mum and dad was there, and I, I was just in tears, and 
it was so out of character as well that you just couldn't explain it. And um, I just couldn't believe anybody could be so hateful. go and fetch her and bring her back to her parents without divulging the identity of, of the abductor to the police. And I uh, realised that this was certainly against the law, so that was not done. The involvement of the media proved double-edged, adding to the pressure. <laughs> The breakthrough came not from a random member of the public spotting Adelia, but from someone closer to home who heard about the story and put two and two together. It was Adelia's estranged husband who provided the crucial information. Just kept nagging at me brain. I'd seen the photo of it, I'd heard the story. It all fitted too well with Adelia's fantasies involving babies. I just contacted the police. Police went to Adelia's address. They had no way of knowing whether this would be just one more fruitless house call, or if she did turn out to be the abductor, what she might have done to baby Natalie. Police looking for snatched baby Natalie Harrell had received a tip off from the estranged husband of the abductor. Five days after the kidnap, on May the 6th, they visited her home, one of hundreds of such checks being made across the country. This time, they found a baby, but they couldn't be sure it was Natalie. It's your baby, madam. Give me the date of birth. March 23rd. March 23rd. You asked me to believe this baby's only six weeks old. Yeah, it's just. Big for his age. Yeah, very big. Under questioning, Adelia admitted the baby was not hers. She said she'd seen a boy shaking a pushchair, and when she told him to stop, he didn't seem bothered. So I decided that I needed to just take, take him for his own protection. Adelia claimed that the only reason she took the baby was because the brother was shaking it violently. So people can justify all kinds of actions through the stories they invent for themselves. This is a really common feature of these cases. These people want to live with themselves afterwards, and they do it by justifying their actions in all kinds of complex and psychologically interesting ways. Police suspected their search was over, but only the family could give a definite identification. Hello, I'm from the local CID. I'm here to tell you that we found the baby. Well, to me, yeah, I just thought, that's Natalie. But Maggie, obviously more maternal, she said, well, I, I, I've got to pick her up and I've got to see her. Whereas I'm almost screaming from the rooftops, we got Natalie back. And that was the big difference between me, me and Maggie at the time. Maggie and Paul were driven to Cardiff Police Station for the journey north. 
can you remember? 20 years ago? Yeah. Gone like that, haven't yeah. it? Yeah, remember like it was yesterday when we arrived at the station here. A decoy car distracted the press. Um, we went downstairs and got in a car underneath, under the ground somewhere, wasn't it's it? Still a blur. Yeah, it's still um, a blur, isn't it? We, we um, w went in one direction and the car went in the other. And uh, we, we were travelling like in the car. Device, I said, didn't I? That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, I was still in a bit of a quandary as, you know, what to think, because I thought, well, what if it isn't her? And, you know, I'm going to be um, so disappointed. I can remember waking up in the night and my parents weren't there, and I thought it was very odd. Um, and my grandmother was there at the time, and she said, go back to sleep now, everything's OK. And I, I said to her, where's mum and mum and dad gone? Oh, they've gone to speak to the police. They shouldn't be long. There was something, the difference in the house, you know, the spirit of the house had changed, something had, something had gone on, and I knew something was ch had changed. Nobody would tell me what was going on until I think that they were sure, you know, that, that you know, that it was definite that it was Natalie. My husband went forward, took the baby off, and I thought, what on earth are you doing? That's not our baby. I don't know whether my mind was playing tricks or something, but the baby was dressed in blue, and I thought, that's not my baby. I thought, what's he doing? You're thinking, are they taking me on a wild goose chase? How do they know it's Natalie? Thinking back now, I remember they asked me, did she have any distinguishing marks? She's got a birthmark on it. She thinks it's there. The birthmark's there, it's Natalie. And I realised then that it was Natalie. But that was, that was a strange feeling, very strange feeling. The next thing I heard was the phone go in, um, and my nan answered the phone and she said, we we found her, so it was quite. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's quite emotional. That part of it is because it's, it's, you know it's happy emotion because it's one of those things you sort of feel as a child. You know that's the best thing that you wanted. You wanted to hear that news. I didn't want you know you you didn't want to hear the news when it was sort of um, bad news. Um, I was hoping that it was happy news and it was a big founder. We arrived on five o'clock in the morning and when we got to the house there was a big banner saying, Welcome home Natalie. Reporters, friends, family, everybody. People out in the street, everybody dancing, drinking partying without us. <laughs> my brother and my friends had gone to the local shop for champagne at two o'clock in the morning and the shop served them. And they said, don't tell us, we're Natalie's back. And as we was there, all the cars were beeping and tooting. So it was a fantastic time. Away from the partying and hubbub, the first few quiet moments together with the family. When I actually held her in my arms, instantly I, I went straight back into mother role. I was like, oh, I got to soothe her. She's crying. It felt really, oh, it was amazing feeling, the best feeling I've ever had. Armfuls of flowers arrived from well wishers. At one stage, we absolutely filled the bath. There were so many bouquets. I mean, I absolutely love flowers. So what we decided to do, we decided to take quite a lot of them up to the local hospital so that the patients up there, because um, we'd, we'd had too many to keep in the house, but it was nice at the time. Well, I was elated, and so were all my staff. So were the media, and I think everybody uh, let out massive cheers. Uh, it was a wonderful thing, because there was a bonding with the family between the police uh, and everybody else, and uh, it was such a lovely outcome to it. John Williams will always hold a special place in our hearts, 
and I, I felt there was a special bond between us, us all and I think that we all worked together as a team to, to get Natalie back and that's what we did. Police, like everybody else, they are family people and when a child is involved they do become sometimes emotionally involved. It's probably the, the best case of uh, my career. A short time after Natalie was found, she was christened, along with Louise and her brother Kevin, partly in thanksgiving. Well, the christening was a great occasion, and they came along to the church, and big numbers came to support them, and it was a very happy day. For Adelia, the story wasn't over. Police searching her house had found a wig used to disguise herself. Also, news cuttings on the kidnap. There was evidence of a bonfire used to burn the coat she'd worn in Cardiff. Adelia appeared at Cardiff Crown Court and claimed the abduction hadn't been planned. But the court heard she told a policewoman she went to Cardiff to get a baby so that she could keep her husband. Police found she hadn't been pregnant for 15 years. She was jailed for three years. I didn't think the sentence was enough for what she did. I thought she could have got a year for each day that she got a, a, had taken her away. Um, I thought at least five years, um, but obviously she only got three. I was a little bit disappointed. To find out then, in 18 months' time, that she, you know, that she was going to be coming out on um, good behaviour was just unbelievable. Um, you think even if she did do the three years, it was, you know, it wasn't very long for what she'd put us through. I think in trying to understand Adelia's state of mind, you're trying to understand the state of mind behind all infant abduction. When you interview abductors, they always say the same kind of things. It's about compensating for loss. It's this absolute pathological desire to have a child, regardless of the consequences. And most also point to the fact that if they just had a child, it would produce some magic solution to a relationship problem. Whatever Adelia's motives, the family feels scant sympathy. I, I don't feel sorry for her in a way because Natalie wasn't hers. She, she had no right to take her. Um, I don't think I will ever forgive her for what she did. She knew exactly what we was going through because every single newspaper had, had Natalie on the front page. So even 20 years on, my feelings for her are still not very good. And if I never see her ever again, that would be soon enough for me. I try not to think about her, because she could have destroyed our life. I felt like I'd nearly destroyed myself as being um, a good mother, but um, I sort of picked myself up from that and thought to myself, you mustn't let this ruin your life, you mustn't let it beat you, you've got to fight this, and you've got to turn it around. Um, it took quite a long time to do that, um, but I did do it, and we've got a happy ending. <laughs> Louise is now 29 with children of her own, aged 5 and 12. I think now adds more of an effect on me, rather than going through my childhood. You know, it's one of those things that have had an effect now where I won't let my children go out unless I know there was somebody, you know, that's safe. It's sort of, I've lost a lot of trust in humanity. I've lost, lost a lot of trust in people. Um, I think that's, that's what it's what done to me. There's one person she can trust. Natalie, now 21, studying chemistry at university, living at home with her parents. It could be, you know, totally different life, you know, I may not be doing my degree, it could be working, it could, well, I could be doing anything. And I wouldn't have, you know, my brother and my sister, I wouldn't have none of my family, would I at all? Yeah, it does, I do think sometimes about it, but, you know, it worked out right in the end, didn't I? And I'm with all my family. I don't really feel hate towards her. It's hard to uh, describe what I feel. It is weird to think that she could be watching this, you know, watching me, but I don't know where she is. I 
don't know what she looks like, you know, she could be anybody. I'm very protective of Natalie, even more so than I, than I ever was. We're always close anyway, uh, you know, as some sisters are. But um, I think um, it brings me closer to Natalie because obviously I want to be there most of the time and I just feel, you know, I'm really lucky and glad that she's with us. Pontypool, the former mining town in the county of Gwent in South Wales. It's a very small, close-knit community. Everybody knows everybody else. It's a really nice place to live. And in September 2002, the suburb of Abbasakan in Pontypool was home to Michael and Desri Baldwin and their three children. Certainly they seemed a very close family. They were no different from anybody else uh, living near here at the time. But a series of horrendous events ripped the family apart following the sudden disappearance of their 15-year-old daughter, Jenna Baldwin. Mike just kept saying to me all the time, Des, she'll be back. Don't worry, you know what she's like. She'll be back. We were given this picture by, by friends uh, of a girl who wanted to just get away from the area, wasn't happy with life in general, a girl who, who talked about running away from home. And as officers from Gwent Police launched one of their largest ever missing persons inquiries, the true circumstances of Jenna's disappearance were exposed. Deep down, I believe Jenna had a big secret. If it was something really, really bad, she may have felt like she could have caused a lot of misery. With such a huge secret at stake, the detectives started to wonder if Jenna hadn't run away, why else would she have disappeared? Had she been abducted? Had she been injured accidentally? We had no idea where she was, but all the indicators were starting to emerge that there was a problem. After moving to a new home in Abbasakan, Jenna's parents decided to divorce. We were both 19. We were really young. We had Jenna a few years later. It just didn't work out. Um, we went our separate ways when she was 18 months old. However, Desri soon had a new man in her life. His name was Michael Baldwin. Yeah, I met Mike in 1990. We hit it off from the start. We got on really well. He was brilliant with Jenna. He, um, took her everywhere he went, she loved him, she started to call him daddy, which is what he wanted, um, and everything was fine, great. The relationship progressed rapidly, and in 1990, Desri and Michael were married with Jenna as bridesmaid. She had a pretty little white dress with yellow flowers on it. The only thing was she wouldn't hold this pose all day. <laughs> she wouldn't hold it for the photographs or anything, but um, we all had a really nice time, a really nice day. This was a new start, a new start for three of us as a family. And to complete the family, Jenna took Michael's surname. Well, I was going to be Mrs. Baldwin, and um, Jenna wanted to be the same as her dad, as she called him then, and myself. So um, we asked Jan's real dad, and he agreed that we could change her name. And that was what she wanted. Desri and Michael went on to have two other children together, and Jenna loved having a younger brother and sister to play with. Jenna was a very good big sister. She um, would take them for walks, she'd look after them. She'd have them helping her to clean. She'd do colouring with them, painting with them. She'd take them swimming. They all got on really well. All in all, Jenna was the perfect child. Never had a moment's problem with her at all. She was homely. She was always in on the computer. And my best friend, really. However, when Jenna entered her teens, her relationship with her parents became fraught with difficulties. She got to 13 and she changed so quickly. Definitely a difficult teenager. And the little girl that I'd brought up to that age just disappeared. And I found that really hard because I'd never had to dis discipline her for anything. Although away from her family, Jenna's friends saw another side of the troubled teen. Most of Jenna's friends was a bit, bit older than her because she was grown up at, for her age, Jenna. She was, she was like a 15 year old. But when Jenna Baldwin suddenly went missing, her friends and family's lives were changed forever.
On Wednesday the 4th of September 2002, Desri returned home at lunchtime to find 15-year-old Jenna banging on the front door. I came home from work to check everything was okay because she hadn't gone to school that morning and I wanted to try and talk to her. She was banging on the door. Mike had been working nights, he'd gone to bed. The key was in the door so I couldn't open the door for her. Um, so I said to her to get in the car and I took her back up to her auntie's where she was staying. Jenna had been staying at her aunt's house following a family argument because she was refusing to attend school. She was fine during the summer because she more or less could have her own freedom, um, do what she wanted to do in the days. I wanted her to go to school. She was very bright. She was in the top set for everything and this was important and I wanted her to see how important it was but she seemed reluctant to want to go back to school that first week of September. But after talking to her mother, Jenna seemed ready to make amends. She's saying to me, don't worry, ma'am, I'm going to go to school next week. I am going to go to school. And for one minute, I sensed a little bit of relief that she was actually going to come home and go to school. So I dropped her off and then I went to work. But the next day, Jenna didn't turn up for school. I didn't know that when I dropped her off on that Wednesday, that was the last time I was ever going to see Jenna. <laughs> On Wednesday, the 4th of September, 2002, Desri Baldwin drove her 15-year-old daughter, Jenna, to her aunt's house in Pontypool, in South Wales. Following a number of arguments about her school attendance, Jenna had been staying with her aunt, but when the weekend came, Desri became concerned that she hadn't heard from her daughter. Jenna was never difficult to get hold of. She carried him up well, it was her life, but I couldn't get hold of her on it. I kept ringing, but there was no answer. I decided that I'd call around um, all of her friends, but I didn't get any joy, nobody had seen her. But on Monday the 9th of September, Jenna got in touch. Mike came in and said that Jenna had phoned. I thought, oh great, she's phoned, she's been in touch, everything's gonna be fine. And the next day, Jenna briefly returned to the house. Mike said Jenna came home with a, a friend who was right here and had a shower and changed and then went. I was a little bit relieved because it, it showed a sign that Jenna was okay, but I wasn't best pleased that I still didn't know where she was, who she was with. I was annoyed with Mike because he didn't actually take the girl's name and he just didn't seem to care that she was missing. On Thursday the 12th of September, over a week after Desri had last seen her daughter, the Baldwins were visited by Jenna's school welfare officer to discuss her truanting. I was absolutely amazed at that meeting because Mike mentioned that Jenna had been in a state with this girl when she was at the house. He'd said that her eyes were rolling, she was acting really strangely, laughing and joking around, and he tried to make up the impression that they'd taken some drugs. Having never known Jenna to use drugs, Desri was forced to accept that something was wrong. And I thought, well, why didn't he tell me that then? Why is he saying this now? I would have called the police straight away. Michael formally reported Jenna's disappearance to the police that evening. And after being interviewed, Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Renane and his team were appointed to investigate the case. I first met Mike and Desiree in the first few days of the inquiry. Desiree struck me as a very honest individual. She knew her daughter very, very well. Michael was concerned for, for Jenna. He talked about the, the impact Jenna had on the family and how Desi was obviously upset the fact that Jenna had been seen for a couple of days. And whilst there were obviously difficulties with Jenna with her schooling, there was nothing really that different to other teenagers and certainly uh, no reason why she should go missing for any, any length of time. Since Michael was the last person to see Jenna, he was invited to Pontypool Police Station to be interviewed for a second time. No, but, you know, we got, we got, got on with when she was Jenna, when, until she started growing up and growing up, and then she's, you know, she, they, get, they get bigger and bigger, and then they, and they start getting cheeky then. However, when the conversation turned to the girl with the red hair, the detectives became even more concerned. This girl with the red hair had never been seen before never been seen in the house, never been referred to by Jenna. And he hadn't really taken much notice of that individual and most parents in those circumstances 
we thought would have asked more questions. But then Michael explained how his relationship with Jenna had been difficult for some time. There was talk of arguments between them and Mike uh, having maybe a, a bit of a dislike to Jenna because of her behaviour, because the way she, she started to speak to her mum and the language that apparently Jenna was using within the house in front of the younger children. Mike certainly didn't, didn't like that. Michael left the police with little to go on, and the detectives had to consider whether Jenna might have either run away or had an accident. They even had to consider the possibility that Jenna had been abducted or even murdered. The difficulty was that we had about four different main lines of inquiry, and I couldn't put all my eggs into any one basket, but all the indicators were starting to emerge that there was a problem. In order to learn more about Jenna, police officers interviewed her friends and discovered that she was a typical 15-year-old girl. When we were in school, we'd just probably be in my bedroom with our music on. One wall was just like mirrored wardrobes. And we'd just we'd sit in the mirrors for hours and just do our makeup, our hair. We used to just do silly things like that, really. But Jenna was mature for her age. Yeah, she had a good head on her shoulders. She was she like a 15-year-old. She was a very outgoing person who got on with a lot of people. And her friends also explained when they had last seen Jenna. The actual last sighting we had was around lunchtime uh, on the 5th of September, and this was backed up by school friends who had seen her then. The detectives were also interested to hear more about Jenna and her recent behaviour. We started to establish a, a picture of, of Jenna, talking about wanting to run away from home and not happy at home, and they painted a picture of this girl who, who just really wanted to up sticks and leave. And at one stage, they were even talking about she wants to run away to London. Possibly she could have gone, could have gone anywhere. But when police officers carried out an inventory of Jenna's clothing, they realised that if Jenna had run away, she didn't seem to have taken anything with her. If she'd gone missing, uh, and she'd been missing for any length of time, she would have taken certain items, makeup, a teddy bear, certain items of clothing that she particularly loved and wore all the time, uh, and they hadn't gone. As the investigation gained momentum, Desri was also proactive in starting a campaign of her own. There was a telephone call that came in from Pontnewenu. So I rang back. Somebody I picked up the phone and, and told me that um, where the phone box was. Hoping the call was from her daughter, Desri immediately headed down to the phone box on the outskirts of Pontypool, but found no sign of Jenna. My friend made up some posters of Jen, put the telephone number on the bottom. And I went down to Pontywood and started sticking them up on all the lampposts in all the pubs. But I didn't have one phone call to say that Jenna was down there. The detectives also felt it was important to ask members of the public for help, and so Desri took part in a press appeal. But a huge response from the public created its own problems. We were having numerous telephone calls of possible sightings in Cumbran, Newport, Cardiff which resulted in us attending the area, seizing CCTV, sitting down viewing the CCTV to try and identify Jenna. So straight away, it became a, a very labour-intensive inquiry. In an effort to identify the mysterious red-headed girl, crime scene investigators visited the Baldwin's house to look for clues. Trying to trace that female, trying to find an unusual party's fingerprints within the home, I actually went back to try and locate dyed red hair. That was all negative. There was nothing. As the investigation progressed, detectives also interviewed Jenna's ex-boyfriend, Chris Jones. When they got together, their relationship was good. He was older, but then she was very mature for her age, and I got on with him really well. But Michael was unhappy about the age difference between the couple. She was 13 and he was 17, and initially it was World War Three in our house. What was said by you then to Jenna about you not being happy with this relationship? I can't remember now. Mike would have nothing to do with it at all. Mike wouldn't have him near the house. Although the relationship lasted two years, the couple eventually broke up. It was obvious she was moving on. He still wanted to be with her. He found it really difficult. But Jenna had outgrown him by that time. She was ready to be back with her friends. Chris explained to the detectives that although the breakup had been difficult, the couple had worked through their problems. They were still very good friends. 
In fact, the week before Jenna was reported missing, Jenna had been seen um, outside on her patio, uh, lying on the patio, talking to Chris, who would quite often come down and have a chat with Jenna. So, so there certainly wasn't a relationship that had split up and they weren't talking, they were still very close. She had a lot of feelings for Chris. She was beginning to start a life. She was just getting on with it, but I do believe deep down that she did love him. Since Jenna often spent time at her ex-boyfriend's house, a forensic search of his home was also ordered. And when the crime scene investigators arrived at the property, they were instantly concerned. And the forensic team had gone into to, to the premises and there was drawings on paper and on the door of a coffin with Jenna R.I.P. written on it. During the forensic examination, there appeared to be what were traces of blood uh, on items of clothing. Obviously, all these put together highlighted the fact that they could be well be more involved, and that's the point that uh, the gentleman was arrested on suspicion of murder. When Chris was arrested, I was shocked. Part of me thought, perhaps he does know where Jenna is, but another part of me thought, I know he wouldn't hurt her. Back at Pontypool Police Station, Jenna's ex-boyfriend, Chris, was refusing to comment. He was kept in custody over a period of day. Uh, myself and my colleague interviewed him, and he initially wouldn't talk to us. However, the detectives were able to build a picture of how the couple spent their time together. From exercise books and Jenna's work books, his books that we seized at the time, they both seemed to enjoy um, various forms of art. Both of them would openly draw things like the coffin with their names on and RIP underneath, and drawing on doors. It's just the way they, they, they treated uh, the, the establishment. And the results of the forensic examination also started to clarify the situation. There were items found at the address had blood on it, which was tested and proved to be an apparent blood stain. But it was analysed and this was never found to be Jenna's blood. Believing they had simply uncovered examples of rebellious teenage behaviour, the detectives released Jenna's ex-boyfriend. It seemed the police were back to square one, but they were about to make a crucial discovery. When first interviewed, her parents had explained that Jenna had telephoned Michael on the 9th of September, four days after she had last been seen. In the first instance, simply to trace that call and find out where uh, she'd made it from. The service provider for the mobile phone uh, call quickly came back to us and said that the call hadn't been made. Now that obviously caused us major concern and really was the point at which I thought we had an issue here with Michael Baldwin. Meanwhile, another team of police officers following up leads generated by the press appeal made a remarkable discovery. We had a series of phone calls from telephone boxes. They were always anonymous. And that was unusual, to have a series of phone calls like that that were, in effect, untraceable. We started to look at possibly where, where was Michael when these phone calls were made. Uh, and it soon became clear that he actually wasn't with Desiree or actually in the home. So that obviously again started raising concerns. Michael's behaviour clearly implicated him in his stepdaughter's disappearance. And to understand his actions, DCI Renane employed some specialist help. We decided to speak with a clinical forensic psychologist to see whether they could give us some advice and guidance on uh, how we might find out if he was in fact making these calls and for what reason he was making them. Was he just supporting Desiree? Was he simply making the calls in the hope that she would turn up one day or, or was he involved in a more sinister way? The psychologist devised a number of triggers which Michael would hopefully respond to and the first was designed to prove whether or not he was making the telephone calls. We decided to emphasise to Michael Baldwin that if Jenna didn't contact us, then we would obviously have to scale up the inquiry and just emphasise that we needed some form of proof that she was alive. Having set the plan into action, DCI Renane then instructed a surveillance team to observe Michael's movements. I fully expected Michael Baldwin to simply go to a telephone box and make a call. Under surveillance, Michael Baldwin went out and purchased a mobile phone under a false name. The surveillance team then observed Michael going into a telephone box and unwrapping the new phone before discarding the packaging in a nearby car park. We seized that packaging immediately 
From the packaging, we were able to identify the IMEI numbers of the phone, the actual telephone number of the mobile, uh, and then from further examination, that's where the box and its contents, Mike Baldwin's fingerprints were all over it. Amazingly, Michael Baldwin then started to make silent phone calls to the family purporting to be Jenna Baldwin. Suddenly, the detectives had a prime suspect in their investigation into Jenna's disappearance. But it was a definitive moment because we knew that Michael Baldwin was now lying. He'd been lying for some time, but we were determined to find out where she was. In September 2002, detectives from Gwent Police launched a missing persons inquiry following the disappearance of Jenna Baldwin, a 15-year-old girl from Pontypool in South Wales. As the investigation progressed, the police soon became concerned by the behaviour of Jenna's stepfather, Michael Baldwin, when they discovered that he had lied about receiving a telephone call from his daughter days after she had last been seen. And Baldwin was soon established as a prime suspect when he was observed purchasing a mobile telephone which he then used to make silent calls home, whilst pretending they were from Jenna. The phone calls varied from total silence to even sort of very low tones of whispering to like low purring noises. Um, but obviously, at that time, no words were actually spoken. Desri also started receiving a number of text messages. I knew straight away that she wasn't writing them. I knew the way that Jenna text and wrote and she could spell and this person couldn't spell. I was glad that she texted me but then worried why couldn't she phone and tell me where she was. But to deflect attention away from himself Baldwin would make sure he was present when calls or text messages were received. So it was quite clear that he'd used the mobile phone to ring the landline, come downstairs to give the impression that hang on look I'm here it's not me doing this and then went back upstairs and switched the phone back off again. And in order to keep up the pretense, Baldwin even took part in a second press appeal. What I was made to feel was that somebody was there with her, stopping her from ringing me, stopping her from being in contact with me, and that she was, she'd been abducted and held, she was being held against her will. Confused and desperate, Desri then took it upon herself to send her own messages asking questions that only Jenna knew the answers to. After my dad, I died, my brother took over the house and him and Jen painted radiators. So I asked, what did you paint in Grancher's house? And it came back a Christmas painting. And I just threw the phone. I thought, I, I couldn't cope anymore with it. Desri then told Baldwin that Jenna had failed to provide the right answer to her question. But it wasn't long before the mistake was corrected. I sat there thinking Jen with Desperation of me. And it came back and it said two radiators. I painted two radiators. And I was elated. Rang the family liaison officers. She's alive, she's alive, because by that time I thought she was dead. Although Baldwin was clearly involved, Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Renane still didn't know the circumstances of Jenna's disappearance and instructed his team to re-interview key witnesses. And when her friends were interviewed for a second time, they confirmed that Michael and Jenna's relationship was far from amicable. He'd had it from a young age of two. She should have grown to love that man, not, not to despise him. You could just see in her emotions when she looked at him, there was nothing. Um, some friends said they were actually present on previous occasions. And even though Jenna's friends were present, Mike straight away was abusive, using foul language towards Jenna, telling her to shut up, telling her to get out of the house. And there was occasions that Mike actually shouted at the friends to get out. And Jenna would come out then shortly afterwards to say that, oh, he just grabbed me, or he just pushed me. 
However, it was when the police officers re-interviewed the family's neighbours that the pieces of the puzzle seemed to fall into place. And when the neighbours told us about an incident where she was aware of Jenna shouting, uh, shouting and screaming outside the house, Mike had better come down and open the door. The detectives were able to establish that this event took place on Thursday the 29th of August, a week before Jenna was last seen by anyone other than Baldwin. Do you remember Jenna shouting words to the effect of, don't laugh at me, Mike, you'll be the one leaving when my mum finds out. Uh, and she formed the opinion that Jenna had obviously been dragged into the house. And uh, it was at that point then she said she heard Jenna screaming. This new information not only revealed why Jenna had been staying away from home, but also the possibility that she was about to divulge an explosive secret. Deep down, I believe Jenna had a big secret. I think maybe she felt a bit scared of all if she had opened up, if it was something really, really bad, she may have felt like she could have caused a lot of misery for her mum, her brother, her sister, and maybe she just wanted to get out and get on with it. Believing this secret could hold the key to Jenna's disappearance, DCI Renane felt he had no option but to proceed on the premise that Michael Baldwin had murdered his stepdaughter. My biggest challenge at that time was, where was Jenna? And how do we get Michael Baldwin to in some way show us where Jenna was or give some indication of what had happened to her. The investigating officers needed a break in the case and during a further examination of Baldwin's financial records, they noticed a discrepancy in his alibi for Friday the 6th of September, the day after Jenna was last seen by her friends. We knew that Des had gone to work that morning. Mike had worked nights the night before on Thursday the 5th. Mike actually took his children to school around half past eight, nine o'clock. He said he went to bed. Through financial investigation, we were able to prove that at two minutes to nine that morning, cash was withdrawn from his account uh, to the value of 10 pound. But then what we did have then, some 15 minutes later, was a transaction to the value of 18 pound 95. The detectives made further inquiries and were stunned when they discovered what Baldwin had spent the money on. Significantly, we'd found that he'd purchased a shovel from a shop in Pontypool using his credit card, luckily for us because he didn't have the cash available. Being in mind, he's telling us that the last time he saw Jenna was on Tuesday the 12th. Why is he buying a shovel on Friday the 6th? Not only did this revelation suggest that Baldwin might have buried Jenna's body, but also that she was murdered less than 24 hours after last being seen by her friends on Thursday the 5th of September. If the detectives could prove that this was the case, then Baldwin had also lied about the existence of the girl with the red hair and Jenna's drug-fueled state back on Tuesday the 10th of September. The search for Jenna intensified with crime scene investigators examining any possible area where Michael might have tried to dispose of his stepdaughter's body. It involved mountain searches, quarry searches, streams being searched by subaqua units. We also used um, sniffer dogs um, trained uh, in identifying um, bodies uh, and we used those on various sites but again nothing nothing came of light and whilst the police scoured the area for clues DCI Renane ordered a second forensic examination of the Baldwin's house scientists fingerprint officers literally took the house apart piece by piece there was nothing to indicate an attack site at that address there was none of the usual blood spatter or cleaning and a scientist looked at it and said he could find nothing other than what he'd expect in your normal home. Throughout the investigation, the detectives continued to monitor Baldwin's behaviour whenever they revealed new information to the family. He became very defensive when we were speaking with Desiree, would often leave the room, uh, wouldn't engage with, with the family liaison officers and really, after a while, wanted to take no part uh, in the inquiry. But still convinced that the police would give up looking for Jenna's body if they thought she was alive, Baldwin continued to send the text messages and to telephone the house. During the time the texts were coming through, it was giving me hope. Hope that she was alive. That I was becoming increasingly suspicious of everybody because it was someone who knew Jenna really well. Towards the end, I, I didn't think that Mike was involved, but I stopped sharing information with people. He was clearly confident, I think, at that point in time, that 
he was probably convincing us that this was Jenna, she was making the text messages, she was making the silent phone calls, and that we would eventually go away. However, DCI Renane and the clinical forensic psychologist were ready to put the final part of their plan into action. As the scenario developed, it was clear that he wasn't going to return to the body straight away, and we had to put in place a number of other prompts to see what he would do. And I remember I was um, making gravy for dinner. The police had asked me to text the phone and ask Jenna to send something personal to the house. And I thought at the time, I thought, well, that's not going to be any help to me, is it? You know, anybody can put a ring in the post. I don't mean Jenna's all right. Although Desri didn't understand the reason for the request, DCI Renane was hoping Baldwin might lead them to Jenna's body. I knew that he was more likely to try to return to that body and actually take something from it in order to show that she was, in fact, still alive. But the plan didn't go quite as expected. Our surveillance team were following him virtually 24 hours a day, and he went out and was seen to put an envelope in the post. But clearly, we knew from a surveillance that he hadn't actually returned to the body. Although Baldwin had posted the ring, he had not led detectives to Jenna's body. When the, the ring turned up, Mike was there, and the police were there to open up the envelope. And it was one of my old engagement rings. And Mike said that he'd saw Jenna wearing it a couple of times, but I assured the police that she'd never worn it. I'd never seen it on her. In order to confirm that Baldwin had sent the ring, DCI Renane requested the envelope to be fingerprinted and tested for DNA. The stamp was submitted as one item and the seal of the envelope as another for DNA comparison. The seal of the envelope, where it had been nicked and shut, was Michael Baldwin. We discovered that the stamp had actually been licked by his daughter to actually put the stamp on that envelope. Uh, obviously, she didn't know what was inside. The detectives were certain they had enough evidence to prove beyond doubt that Baldwin had been involved in Jenna's disappearance. And suspecting him of murder, Michael Baldwin was arrested on Tuesday, October the 29th, 2002. When we did arrest him, he pleaded innocence and was initially quite dismissive and, again, quite confident, I think, that he could see it through and that we couldn't prove anything. But Baldwin was unaware that he had been under constant surveillance for weeks. When we started to put the information to him, the fact that he'd been under surveillance, he didn't know that. The fact that he purchased the mobile phone using a false name. The fact that, obviously, he'd been on the television knowing all this, pleading for her to return, meant that he was then in a very, very difficult position. But yet again, as he was talking to us, he, he kept giving us more light, which we were able to disprove. And the police had another problem to deal with. One of the difficult things at that point in time was to tell Desiree what had happened and what information we had, because she couldn't understand why we'd arrested her husband. Desiree was taken aback when she heard of Baldwin's arrest. I was really shocked and protective of him, really, because they'd already arrested Jenna's boyfriend, and that proved nothing. And I just thought it was a formality that he was going in to ask questions. But when Desri was presented with all the evidence collected by the police, her worst fears were confirmed. When I discovered that the police knew that it was Mike that bought the mobile phone and it was Mike that was texting me, I was in such a mess when I found out he bought the, the shovel. And that's when I knew my daughter was dead. And on Friday, the 2nd of November, 2002, Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Renane felt he had enough evidence to charge his prime suspect, Michael Baldwin, with Jenna's murder. And I think at that point in time, he probably knew that the game was up, but he still thought that he could get away with it if Jenna's body wasn't found. But what he didn't account for was the determination of Desiree Baldwin. 2002. Desri Baldwin dropped her daughter Jenna off at her aunt's house and never saw her again. Following extensive investigation, Desri's husband, Michael Baldwin, was arrested for his stepdaughter's murder. But when questioned, he refused to reveal where he had buried Jenna's body. However, Desri wasn't ready to give up on her daughter. And when Baldwin asked her to visit him in prison, she agreed to his request. 
I said I'd go if he'd tell me where Jenna was. But when I got there, I couldn't even really look at him. Before I went in, I was hysterical. I said, well, I've come to find out where Jenna is. And he said, I don't know. I don't know. Why should I know where she is? So I just got up and walked out. In the days that followed the visit, Baldwin kept calling Desri and eventually caught up with her when she and the children were visiting his parents. His mum said, Mike's got something to tell you. But when I went on the phone, he still wasn't telling me where Jenna was. In a desperate bid to get him to reveal the whereabouts of her daughter's body, Desri even suggested a possible alibi. And I said to him, well, maybe something had happened. You accidentally killed her. Then it would be manslaughter and you'd only get, like, a few years. But Baldwin still refused to admit any involvement, leaving Desiree with only one option. To him I said, well, if you don't tell me where she is, you won't see her children again. And he knew I meant that. And then he told me where she was. Um, he said to me, she's over the keeper's pond, down over in one of the laybys. Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Renane and his team were soon on the road, but when the detectives reached the area, there were no signs of any burial site. I still didn't trust him, even at that point, and I, I still wondered whether there was another chapter to this, to this particular story, and whether he was actually going to take us to the body. But Baldwin admitted defeat and took the police officers straight to the spot where he had buried Jenna. It wasn't until I physically saw Jenna I thought, yes, he, he's eventually told us something which is truthful. In the early hours of Tuesday, the 19th of November, 2002, Jenna's body was found. The police came to the house with her ring so that they could identify Jenna. Part of me was happy that they found her because that was my goal. But then part of me, you know, the realisation that she wasn't coming back. And then I was just beside myself, absolutely beside myself. As the forensic archaeologist and his team excavated Jenna's body, Baldwin was questioned again and asked to provide a full confession. We said Jenna had come home. She was shouting and swearing at him whilst he was walking up the stairs. Um, she was hitting him. He said, apparently, he sort of lashed out, and it was purely accidental, but Jenna fell down the stairs and stopped breathing. He described um, how he put her in the car with the intention of taking her to the hospital, but whilst driving, he said he was aware then that she was, she was dead. He panicked, he was crying, he was upset, uh, and he stopped, and for whatever reason, he decided to bury Jenna at that location. But when the crime scene investigators revisited the house and examined the scene of the supposed accident, they weren't convinced. If he'd have carried out the actions he said, he would have hit the wall, not Jenna. So it was, as he described it, it couldn't have happened. She could not have been pushed backwards down the stairs. And two extensive post-mortems on Jenna's body also failed to corroborate Baldwin's story. The confession he made was not consistent with the injuries that she had and anything else. If, as he said, she'd fallen down the stairs and died, you'd have expected to find a fractured neck, broken back, some life-threatening injury, and there were none present. Normally, if you fall, any death is normally a slow process where the, the brain would actually swell, whereas Mike is now portraying and it's fall down the stairs and death occurring almost instantaneously. So unfortunately, from the post-mortem, the cause of death was totally inconclusive. However, the investigation had also uncovered evidence that Baldwin had the technical ability to kill through his expertise in judo. He was uh, trained to a brown belt standard. As part of the brown belt uh, examination, he would have to demonstrate at least five strangulation moves, but to reach that standard, you would have known ten. But all these holes could prove fatal within seconds rather than prolonged strangulation. And again, this fitted in with what the pathologist was saying. The wealth of evidence already uncovered clearly indicated that Baldwin had murdered his stepdaughter. But without a full confession, detectives were left to draw their own conclusions as to the events of Thursday, the 5th of September, 2002. I think that Jenna came home that day, tried to get into the house. He was trying to either sleep or relax. There's no doubt that she was shouting and, and probably swearing to get in. 
I think there was confrontation. And I think whatever that confrontation was, and whatever was said, meant that Michael Baldwin decided at that point in time that enough was enough, and that he was going to either kill her, or he was going to really cause her some serious harm. And obviously with him being a, a judo brown belt, a very, very big, strong man, um, she would have stood no chance at all in any struggle with him. Hopefully, um, you know, she died quickly. But one of the most callous things that he then did was to obviously take her in the car, put her into the boot of that car, and took her down to Abergavenny uh, and buried her. You know, if he hadn't done that, if he'd just been open and honest at that point in time, he would have saved so much trauma and so much distress for all the family concerned. On Tuesday, June the 10th, 2003, Michael Baldwin's trial started at Cardiff Crown Court, and seven weeks later, he was found guilty of murdering his 15-year-old stepdaughter, Jenna Baldwin. And um, I can remember sitting down and thinking, gosh, they, they believed me, <laughs> they believed us as a family, that, but it didn't actually sink in until like two or three weeks later how much we'd achieved. And... But even though Baldwin received a life sentence for his crime, he has never revealed exactly how or why he murdered Jenna. My own personal opinion, I believe something certainly happened on possibly more than one occasion between Mike and Jenna. The indication was that Jenna was about to tell um, Desiree something that in Jenna's opinion would, would mean Michael would be leaving the matrimonial home. And that is why Michael um, had to silence Jenna. Desiree Baldwin is now left to rebuild her life whilst carrying the knowledge that the man she loved not only murdered sleepy suburb on the outskirts of Durham, the cathedral city in the northeast of England. A place where people take real pride in appearances. It's the kind of area that local estate agents describe as much sought after and desirable. When George and Christina Button moved here in 1998, they felt they'd made it, and so did their relatives. I was quite amused that they bought this huge house. <laughs> After won the lottery was the first thing I thought. <laughs> And I thought, well, he would have told us that, I think, if he won the lottery. Sadly, there was no lottery win, but that didn't stop Christina Button from wanting all the trappings to go with her expensive new home. I think Christina wanted to be classy. She wanted to have, you know, the nice things, you know, the best foods and the best shoes, and that's how she was. But the Button suburban dream was not all that it seemed, and the family was about to be hit by tragedy. You read about these things happening in the paper, it's always something that happens to someone else. You look back and you think, this sort of thing doesn't happen to our old family. It's as if you're on the outside now, watching uh, something on the television, a, a movie. As dusk fell on Monday, March the 3rd, 2003, the Button family was on the move. Their lodger, Christina's nephew, had already left the house when Christina and George were preparing to take their dog, Laddie, out for a walk. It seemed to be a normal evening routine, but there was nothing normal about this particular evening. 
Three people left the house, but only two were to return. What happened that night was to lead to a bloody crime that shocked even hardened detectives. George and Christina Button first met in 1993, and although their family was happy for the couple, some were surprised by the 21-year age difference. Because he hadn't had relationships in the past, I think when a 20, 22-year-old woman starts to make a fuss of you, you're going to be flattered. And it seemed to escalate the relationship very, very quickly, and that's what concerned people. After a courtship of 18 months, the couple were married in October 1994. We were married in Sunderland Registry Office, and there was a bridesmaid there with another bridesmaid. It was a good day, was, everything went off perfectly. Some found Christina's manner abrupt, but the couple seemed to make a good team. People perceived early on that she was quite dominant, but I suppose you just think opposites attract. He was the very quiet, gentle guy, and she was the life and soul of the party, and people just thought they'd clicked. Christina's influence on George was immediate. He had always been careful with his money, but now his young wife brought about a change in him. His life changed for the better. Um, he was doing things which he hadn't been doing. He went to the theatre, um, the wealth of meals, so his life did change a lot. In 1996, the couple shared some very special news with George's brother and niece. When we found out that Christina was pregnant, everyone was absolutely delighted, um, really, really pleased. And my uncle George, obviously, because of his age, I don't think he ever thought he would be a dad. George was absolutely over the moon. He was like a dog with two tails. He, he couldn't, he was ecstatic, he was on cloud nine. He was so pleased, it was unbelievable. Two years later, the couple moved to a leafy suburb near Durham. They bought a newly built house directly opposite George's niece and immediately made an impact. Christina was like the social secretary of the street, really. I would often see the neighbours having dinner parties and evenings out, and the ladies on the street would have a Christmas party night, which she would organise. She was very, very good at that life and soul of the party, very sociable. But the dynamics of this happy household were about to change forever. George took pity on Christina's troubled young nephew and, soon afterwards, Simon Tannerhill moved in. My uncle George seemed, at the time, quite happy that he was there. They were helping him out. I think he'd fallen out with, with his parents and Christina had offered him somewhere to stay. Simon settled in and soon became part of the family, helping around the house and going out for a beer with George. You know, it was a family, Christina, their little girl, my Uncle George and Simon, because he was living there. Um, they would go for meals, and, and I think they did socialise a little bit together. He was a, a kind guy and was helping out, you know. My Uncle George was older, you know, he was working. So why not have someone help out around the house and with the DIY and things? But the Buttons family's world was about to be changed forever. Around 7.30 on Monday the 3rd of March 2003, Clyde Best was driving down a dark country lane near the Button's house. He spotted something suspicious blocking part of the road. Clyde decided to investigate, but upon closer inspection he discovered that the obstacle was actually the body of an unconscious man. Clyde didn't know the man, but he would be haunted by his name from this night on. The man's name was George Button. How did George end up lying alone in a dark country lane fighting for his life? Everything pointed towards a tragic traffic accident. And the way he was lying was as though he had been hit. It could have been by a wing mirror of a car and knocked him down. And that was, that's what I thought had happened. On Monday, 3rd of March, 2003, George Button was found unconscious on a dark country lane less than a mile from his home in County Durham. His injuries were severe, and initially he was thought to be the victim of a hit-and-run road traffic accident. Upon discovering George, Clyde Best had gone to find help and returned with local resident Jeff Lockerby and his wife Sarah, a trained first aider. I laid the blanket over 
the victim and noticed there was a lot of blood coming out of his mouth and ears and that he was making low snoring noises which is an indication that he had a, um, a head injury and there was an awful lot of blood lying around. I also went over and tried to help uh, the victim and as we were doing this we could hear the sirens in the background of an approaching police car and at that point the police officer came and he really took over, didn't he? Yes, he did. When PC Paul Blair arrived on the scene, he was shocked by what he saw. I've seen a lot of people who've been involved in serious incidents and you, you just get an indication as to how bad injuries can be and that was one of the worst I'd seen. PC Blair immediately checked for signs of life and found that despite extensive head injuries, George was fighting to stay alive. The victim was unable to speak barely conscious and uh, drifting into unconsciousness. I feared the worst. Paramedics were soon on the scene and fearing that they might lose George at any minute, they raced against time to stabilise his condition and take him to hospital. As the ambulance sped towards Durham University Hospital, PC Blair spotted that George had suffered another, more unusual injury. Once the victim was taken into the ambulance, I noticed the injury to his hand. He had a finger missing. One possibility would be that the injury to his hand was a defensive wound, as if the victim had put his uh, hand up to protect his head. Back at the scene of the incident, the Accident Investigation Unit was combing the area, looking for clues to explain what might have happened to George. There was nothing that suggested to me that the vehicle had been involved. There was, there was no tire marks whatsoever, there was no vehicle debris whatsoever, and the scene itself just wasn't reminiscent of a, of a hit and run accident scene. At the hospital, the full extent of George's injuries was becoming obvious. His head had probably swollen twice, if not three times its normal size. All his fingernails were ground down and all dirty, as if he'd been sort of scrabbling at the ground. And I remember his knees were very grazed, which, you know, it makes you think that he hadn't been knocked unconscious straight away, that there had been a time when he was on all fours and, and had obviously suffered. As the family tried to comprehend how serious the situation was, Christina repeatedly asked doctors if her husband would ever speak again. I remember Christina kept asking, will, will he speak? Will he talk? I'd taken it in that he was never going to speak again. He was never going to wake up again. And I just thought, my God, she's being so hopeful. And indeed, as the family maintained their bedside vigil, Fred found out just how serious his brother's injuries were. I don't think I was supposed to hear this because I was sort of standing in the end of this corridor, and this is when the doctor came out of the operating theatre and said that uh, there's major head injuries, we don't, he's not going to recover. Exact words were, he's not going to come out of this. But I remember him saying those words, he's not going to come out of this. The police still didn't know how George ended up with such serious injuries, so a senior detective was brought in to lead the investigation. The officers who went there felt things weren't right. There was something suspicious about it. They didn't know whether the man had been assaulted or whether he'd been the, the victim of a, a road traffic accident. With no obvious physical evidence at the scene, George's blood was a vital clue as to what might have happened. What you could see was a pool of blood. What I was wanting was um, any blood splattering, which is much harder to see by the naked eye. You really need to take a very, very close inspection. And again, that's why the FSS can come up with, again, their, their equipment to try and identify that. And that is what's important to a certain extent to indicate as to whether there's been an assault or whether it's been a one-off blow, potentially by uh, being hit by a passing vehicle. The FSS, or Forensic Science Service, was called in to assist the investigation. Didn't really come to any firm conclusions in terms of road traffic accident versus assault. And, and really just um, made suggestions as to items to look at in particular. It was obvious to me that I needed to look at um, the injured party's clothing. 
to help build up a picture as to what may happen to him. But the lack of any immediate conclusion from the forensic experts meant that the investigation team had to keep their options open. It was very frustrating because that, to a certain extent, will lead how we are going to structure the investigation and, and what lines of inquiry that we're going to go down. Dave Jones had to make the decision that we were going to investigate it as a parallel investigation. We were going to go down the road traffic accident route as a hit and run, but also go down the assault route. The results of the forensic tests wouldn't be available for some time yet, but Detective Superintendent Jones needed to move the investigation on. I regarded Christina and Simon as being significant witnesses, and I wanted to get a detailed account from both of them as to uh, you know, the events of that, that night and what had happened uh, in the run-up. But before the interview could proceed, Christina was called back to the hospital where she was faced with a life or death decision. George had suffered such serious brain damage that after a series of detailed examinations, his doctors could not find any signs of response in his brain stem. This is about the third test to do, I think it is. Uh, two doctors to do the test, and if there's no response, they turn the machine off at lunchtime. The doctors explained to Christina that there was no chance of George recovering and asked for permission to turn his life support machine off. I don't know how the system works, but I assume that we yeah, can't go any further. We want to switch the support machine off, and she must have agreed to that, yeah. I had no input into it at all. The decision wasn't mine to make. Christina watched as her husband and father to her seven-year-old daughter passed away. I held his hand, and they just turned the machine off, and you just watched the oscilloscope just go from beating down to the flat line, and you knew then that that was all over, all finished. You kind of describe, really, what it feels like. You're just basically sitting there, absolutely helpless. Nothing you can do, not a thing. Whether his injuries were the result of being hit by a vehicle or an attack, George Button's death raised the stakes in the investigation. When George died, that changed the status of the inquiry. We were no longer just looking at either a hit and run or a serious assault. We were able to say uh, this is a murder and we're now looking for the person or persons who have committed the murder. Even though the police were now running a full-blown murder inquiry, Detective Superintendent Jones offered to postpone Christina's interview to allow her time to grieve. But to the amazement of the investigation team, Christina rejected the offer, and barely 24 hours after watching her husband die, she was interviewed about the intricate details of her life with George. Christina insisted that she was ready and she wanted, and she wanted to actually get it out of the way. Uh, at the time, it raised one or two eyebrows. Obviously, I appreciate it's a very distressing time at the moment for you, and I just appreciate that you're coming in to speak to us today. My thought on that was, well, that takes a very determined, hard type of person to be there at the hospital, authorise the, the uh, life support machine to be switched off, and then to, to uh, come and sit down and, and make a witness statement. Christina explained how they were just a typical couple. We didn't propose to, as we just, we just, I don't know, it just happened that we were getting married and we got married in the, the following year, in the September. Like. Bearing in mind that only a day earlier, Christina had authorised her husband's life support machine to be switched off, the police were surprised how calm she was. She was fairly in control and, and, and had a good recollection of of the issues and, and of the circumstances prior to uh, George's uh, attack. Simon Tannerhill was interviewed next. He had little to say. Um, I think it's fair to say as well that you actually lived or lived with, uh, with Christina and George. Yeah. So how long have you been doing that? It's about two months. Right. Was there a particular reason for that, that you've moved in there? Well, because me and my dad didn't get on. Whilst the interviews continued, forensic scientist Dr Gemma Escott was making progress in examining the patterns of blood left on George's clothes and reached a conclusion which would redefine the investigation. When a blow is struck onto a, a person and there's no blood at that first initial blow available to transfer either onto the weapon or um, the surrounding area. But once the, the weapon is lifted away, Blood is well to the surface of the injury, which when a second blow comes in, 
impact spatter will be generated, that is spots and splashes of blood flying away from that area of impact. This is my case file that was prepared in relation to this case. It gives you an idea of the sort of work that goes into the examination of an item, and in particular um, into a blood pattern analysis. These arrows mark the direction of the representative blood spots. Um, and as you can see, they're radiating away from the area at the back of the head where the injuries were sustained. And that's a characteristic feature of impact spatter. So for that number of stains to have, have been deposited, I would expect at least two. And in fact, I favoured three blows to have been struck on um, the back of the head. In my opinion, the, the possibility that George Button was involved in a road traffic accident can be discounted. And upon closer analysis of the bone fragments at the point of impact, the case pathologist Dr Nigel Cooper concluded George had probably been hit six or seven times. Dr Cooper was able to, to, uh, to say that this was an assault and a number of blows had been struck with uh, massive force. And he indicated that we, we should be looking for um, you know, uh, somebody who was physically a big man. He described somebody swinging uh, something like a baseball bat or an iron bar with the full force of a, uh, a baseball uh, shot. Unknown to the pathologist, the police were already interviewing someone who fitted that description. He was six foot four and weighed 20 stone, Simon Tannehill. Simon was physically capable of carrying out the, the attack, but it would appear that there was no motive for Simon of his own volition to carry out the attack. Within only a few days of the assault on George Button, detectives from Durham Constabulary had identified how he was killed and put together a physical profile of the assailant. But was the assault carried out by a stranger as a random attack, or could the killer be closer to home? What we needed was something which would be either physical evidence or evidence from a witness who knew uh, what had actually uh, happened. On Monday, March the 3rd, 2003, George Button was found unconscious on a dark country lane in the suburbs of the city of Durham in the northeast of England. The pathologist revealed that the assailant must have been a tall, well-built man, a description that immediately implicated George's nephew, Simon Tannehill. But could the 20-year-old really have been involved in the murder of his uncle? And if so, what would drive him to carry out such a cold, callous act? As Simon and George Button's wife, Christina, continued to be questioned, they were asked to provide details of George's movements on the evening of the attack. We were going separate ways. Yeah, yeah. we didn't, like, stop and talk, and yeah. then him, well, then, mm. then me turn and go mm. there. We just sort of crossed the road, and he just headed straight for the lane, and I just... So you went off to the right? Mm. Yeah, to the post office. Right. Christine said she walked off to the, towards the post box with George and she left George uh, taking the dog down Mark's Lane and that was the last time she saw George alive. Meanwhile, Simon said he had driven Christina's car to the nearby petrol station to buy some milk. He then met Christina at the post office so he could return her car. She then drove to collect her daughter from the Brownies, while Simon then took his own car and drove to his sister's house to drop off a DVD. Where does your sister live? She lives in South End. All oh, right. Okay. Um, and then I just, I just run in there, dropped it off, said hello. I didn't see the kids because they weren't downstairs. They must have been in bed. Um, they both then separately returned to the to the house where uh, they had uh, showered and got got dressed uh, ready for bed. Although by that time it was only eight o'clock in the evening at which time George was racing towards hospital in the back of an ambulance, fighting for his life. In order to understand how he had met his death, every aspect of George's life was scrutinised. I was able to go uh, to the media, for instance, and say, we now, we now know that this is a murder and that's how it's being treated. We need to uh, understand who the victim is, so we need to explore with his family, with his friends, we call the victimology. 
As detectives delved into the lives of the Buttons, they uncovered a world of debt and domination. George and Christina had moved into a leafy suburb outside Durham in October 1998, buying their dream home in a quiet cul-de-sac opposite George's niece. I was quite amused that they bought this huge house and wondered how this house was getting paid for. It was, it was a big, big house they bought. Being neighbours gave Helen and Christina the opportunity to spend more time together. And as their friendship blossomed, Helen became aware of Christina's favourite pastime, shopping. Christina liked to spend, you know, Russell and Bromley shoes, for example. Um, it sounds silly now, but the best food from Sainsbury's. Um, it was all, always the best of everything, and that, that's what she wanted. And Christina had a particular weakness when it came to treating herself. Probably the main thing she liked to spend the money on was shoes. Um, I don't know if my Uncle George had any idea what Russell and Bromley was, but there were lots of Russell and Bromley boxes. But the nice house, new clothes, and her obsession with shoes all cost money. And credit cards up to the hilt and put who's on, do you know? Right. Um, when it's nothing that wasn't manageable, that oh, you no. get a spiral out I've of control. I've done the odd pawning of jewellery before, but who, who, mm. <laughs> I think there's hundreds of people have, you know. Mm. And the rest of us who, who live nearby felt that mm. there was the whole keeping up with the Joneses, which sounds laughable now, but that's how it was and that's how she was and I think we recognised that but because we liked her we sort of saw it as more of a joke really. Although George didn't find the situation funny it soon became clear to the police that neither he nor Simon were in a position to challenge Christina. The picture that was emerging of the household was that Christina was very much the dominant uh, person of the, of the men in the, in the household. Without a doubt, Christina was in control. Despite the age difference, uh, my Uncle George is a very, very passive man, and she was certainly the domineering character in the relationship. But I also think that there would be some things that he didn't know about, for example, the money from, from the pawnbrokers. Christina had taken a job working at a family-run pawnbrokers, but in an effort to solve her own financial problems, she made a desperate move. The first my Uncle George knew of it was when the owner turned up at their house and told him that Christina had taken, I think it was £11,000, from the pawnbroker company. The owner said that if she repaid the money, he wouldn't take it further. So they did. The pawnbroker not only wanted his money back, but additionally demanded an estimated £6,000 in interest. Since they already owed around £50,000, the couple had no other option but to remortgage the family home. But Christina failed to learn her lesson, and even though the remortgage cleared their initial debts, they were soon back to square one. At the time of the incident, um, between them, they had uh, 14 uh, different credit cards the majority of which uh, related to uh, Christina. And um, they, they had debts on those credit cards of, in the region of £60,000. As Christina's relentless spending continued, the couple tried to find new solutions to cope with the ever-increasing repayments they faced. But it was George who had to make the sacrifices. I'm not sure how I found out that my Uncle George was delivering pizza. He was working for a pizza shop on the edge of Durham. I think Christina knew the owner, I'm not certain. I remember being surprised because he wasn't in the best of health. Um, his knees were bad, he had epilepsy, um, and he obviously had his job with the council as well as an electrician. And then he was driving around Durham until the early hours delivering pizza. And that made me think that something must be up. No matter how bad things got, Christina often commented on how one day all of her financial problems would be solved. And I remember her vividly saying that one day she would be a rich young widow, although I thought it was really distasteful talking like that. You know, just laughed it off and didn't really make a comment. 
As the police continued to examine the Buttons' lifestyle, they realised just how rich Christina would become in the event of George's death. During the financial investigation, we, we uncovered life insurance policies on, on, on George. They were uh, of a substantial value, which would have more than paid off the debts, would have more than paid off the, the mortgage in relation to the house, and would have left Christine substantially better off of, of hundreds of thousands of pounds. That in itself was, was a huge motive. For the first time, the police had found a motive for the attack on George, but there was nothing more than circumstantial evidence to imply that Christina was involved. The fact remained that at the time of the attack, the Buttons owed approximately £195,000, including the remortgage. But in the event of George's death, the life insurance policies were worth over £450,000. Two of those were quite substantial and were kept up to date, had been paid regularly against a background of considerable debt. The insurance policies would have paid off that debt uh, repaid the, the mortgage uh, and still has left uh, in excess of two, £250,000. As the police started to put the pieces of the puzzles together, they began to wonder whether Christina could also be involved in George's murder. We obviously had what appeared to be this uh, horrendous financial situation uh, in the household. The relationship between Christina and George and the way she treated George. The police realised that Christina clearly had a motive to kill George, but she wouldn't have been physically capable of carrying out the attack. Could her nephew and lodger Simon have also been involved? And how did you get on with George? Like friends? Yeah. Like friends? It would appear that there was no motive for Simon social, of his own volition to carry out the attack. Where that was coming from was Christina and the apparent um, sympathy that um, Simon had for her uh, situation at debt. But it was still a question of whether Simon had seen the situation and decided to act on his own or whether he was being induced to do so by Christina. Suspecting that they had potentially uncovered a plot to kill George, the police decided to re-examine Christina and Simon's alibis for the hours leading up to the attack. During that day, we know that Simon had um, feigned illness and taken the day off work uh, sick uh, and was at home. But also that during the day, there had been a number of telephone calls exchange between Simon and Christina. Analysis of mobile telephone records revealed that it was unusual for Christina and Simon to call each other so much during the day. In order to help the police verify her movements on the night of the attack, Christina was able to name a number of people who had seen her and even explain how she would have been caught on camera. Stood an angry mother to come along beside Jilly and said it was number 42, the lady with the cameras. She uh, identified to us that there was a house on the, uh, the corner of the estate which actually had private CCTV and indicated, directed us really to that particular premises to, to recover that CCTV to confirm a story. Simon was also able to explain his movements on the night, which again included being caught on CCTV at the local petrol station. Whether it was, was deliberate ploy by both Simon and Christine to catch themselves on CCTV prior to the, the actual uh, assault on George, um, personally I think that's probably something that they have thought about and planned. Although this evidence corroborated Christina and Simon's alibis, statements from eyewitnesses highlighted a discrepancy in the timeline of events. If they had done what they had described, everything could have been done in a matter of two or three minutes, not the 20 uh, minutes that they were describing uh, it had taken. So obviously that in itself was very uh, suspicious. Detective Superintendent Jones discovered there was a period of approximately 17 minutes unaccounted for in the pair's alibis, leading him and his team to formulate their own theory as to what might have happened. What we believe has actually happened is Simon has left the, the house prior to George and Christine going out. He's gone to the garage to try and provide himself some sort of alibi. He's then 
gone down Mark's way and he's waited there. Christine has then come out with George. It wasn't normal practice for her to go walk on the dog. That was always George's thing. I think Christine's come out to steer George down towards Mark's way, which hence the pretense of posting the letter. She's then left George at the top of uh, Mark's way, knowing fine well Simon is waiting in the, uh, further down the lane in the darkness, intending to uh, attack George. And the police found even more irregularities in Christina and Simon's stories. It seemed unusual that Christine would go out and, and, and post letters. The first question that, that, that we asked ourselves was, George was already going out, why didn't you just ask George to do it? And also, it wasn't a really common practice for her to be writing letters, to be paying credit bills, etc. by cheque. So that, again, itself was a little bit unusual. Simon's sister, in her original interview, also contradicted his statement by saying that he was only at her house very briefly. She later changed her story. Even though the circumstantial evidence against Christina and Simon seemed strong, concrete proof of their involvement was needed. The police had reached a stalemate. What we needed was something to go with that circumstantial evidence which would, give, would, would be either physical evidence or evidence from a witness who knew uh, what had actually uh, happened. But the police were about to make a major breakthrough. On Saturday evening, only five nights after the attack, a key witness came forward. What made the defining moment was when the uncle ran in and informed us about what Simon had told. That, that's to me is when the, when the whole emphasis of the investigation started to change. As police officers from Durham continued to investigate the murder of George Button, they uncovered a mountain of debt generated primarily by his wife, Christina. Inquiries into the Button's lifestyle had also revealed that as a result of George's death, Christina was in line to receive almost half a million pounds from life insurance. The police believed Christina's nephew, Simon, was more than physically capable of carrying out the attack, while circumstantial evidence suggested Christina had a motive to kill her husband. However, the police had nothing concrete to charge the pair with, until now. On the Saturday evening of the first week of the inquiry, we got a telephone call completely out of the, the blue from Simon's uncle, who said that he had some important information uh, regarding what, what, what had happened. And he asked to meet with um, some police officers. Basically told us that Simon had approached him uh, a few days earlier and had asked him if he knew if you could get somebody to uh, kill somebody for him. He'd given a cotton bull story about it was something to do with a, a drugs deal that had uh, gone wrong. When the uncle had said, no, I don't know anybody who can, who can do that thing. It's not the sort of thing that uh, the uncle was into. But Simon had gone into, into more detail. He explained that the bullock would have to be handy, in his words because uh, the, the person who he wanted to be attacked was a big bloke and that it would take place in a quiet country lane while the man was walking his dog. Upon hearing about the near-identical attack on George Button, who was six foot two inches tall and 20 stone, the uncle felt compelled to inform the police of his conversation with Simon. Immediately, things started to click into place with our investigation and indicated that this was actually a premeditated attack. That evidence confirmed Simon Tannehill as a suspect. What we still needed to, to find out was the degree of involvement of Christina Button. She certainly had the motive. She certainly had the, the, the ability to plan it. He certainly had the physical presence to be able to do that. He'd given an account which wasn't really checking out in relation to his movements. And we had the information and the evidence in relation to Simon and the uncle and planning to attack a man, walking his dog um, in a secluded area. The police were becoming ever more convinced of Simon and Christina's involvement in what they believed to be a premeditated attack. Did it go right the way back to when the insurance policies were taken out and had this always been the plan? Or was there a, a, a straw that brought the camels back uh, in that things just became so unmanageable uh, financially, and uh, uh, that Christine decided that's when George was going to be killed.
Detective Superintendent Jones needed to make a key decision. Do we have reasonable cause to suspect that Christina Button and Simon Tannehill are responsible for the murder of George Button? And I took the decision that we did have reasonable cause. Christina and Simon were arrested separately the following morning. I had no idea that Simon or Christina were regarded as suspects in any way. I'd been spending time with them, you know, having tea with them, making sure that she was all right, uh, trying to be supportive. Um, so no idea at all. Whilst they were being interviewed, forensic teams scoured their home, clothes and vehicles for any evidence that could link the pair to the crime. I think there's no doubt in this case that uh, they were forensically aware. We never actually uh, found any of the clothing that Simon Tannehill was wearing when he was seen on the CCTV at the garage, which in itself was significant. The clothing has obviously been disposed of by Tannehill before returning to the house. And the, the fact that uh, they had both showered and changed by eight o'clock that evening raised our suspicions. As well as disposing of the clothes he was wearing on the night George was killed, police also believed that Simon had got rid of the murder weapon. The pathologist had given us an indication of what type of weapon uh, we should be looking for, and he suggested it would be uh, something like uh, a, a large, heavy uh, iron bar. We know Simon Tannehill used to carry an iron bar. It was part of a heavy-duty uh, car jack and he had told other people that he carried that in order to defend himself. That iron bar was never found, and although others were, they couldn't be linked to the murder. But Simon's car did reveal another clue, a drop of George's blood. However, since George also had access to the car, the police couldn't rely on this new evidence as concrete proof of Simon's involvement. Although forensic evidence was proving hard to find, the pair's behaviour during police interviews was starting to give them away. Neither of them ever turned on each other. They both just maintained the, the, the story and neither one elaborated or tried to blame, uh, put more blame on, on one or the other. And their unwavering support for each other only convinced the police that the two suspects were both involved in the crime. It was never a question of, I can't believe he's done it, or I can't believe she's done it. It was always um, this kind of mutually sympathetic uh, attitude that they adopted. Although Christina stood to gain almost half a million pounds if George died, the police never uncovered a motive that would drive Simon to kill her husband. Had Christina promised her nephew a share of the money, or was he just desperate to please her? The peculiar nature of their relationship, combined with all the circumstantial evidence, was more than enough to convince the police of their guilt. Because neither of them admitted any guilt, there's obviously a question mark in relation to exactly what role both of them played. Personally, I think she, uh, she was very controlling and she certainly had persuaded and cajoled Simon to do what she wanted to do. He looked up to her, he had some sort of hero worship or, or some sort of fantasy figure in, in, in his mind with her. We never established exactly what the reasons were. The whole point of a, an inquiry of this kind is to achieve justice for the victim. And that means finding and bringing to justice the people who are responsible. When it became apparent that this was a joint enterprise, that's the attitude that we took. We would pursue both of them and bring them both to justice. And on Thursday, March the 13th, 2003, Christina and Simon were charged with the murder of George Button. I was floored by that, I couldn't believe it. Um, but the next thing that concerned me was the fact I would have to, I would have to ring my dad. I didn't believe they'd done it. And then when the police came through and they said they had enough evidence to charge them, I thought, well, they must be pretty sure. In November 2003, the trial reached Newcastle Crown Court. After four weeks of evidence, Fred Button had no doubt about what the verdict should be. When the jury went out, I hope they're going to come out with you because I was convinced then, after what I'd heard at, at the trial, that they were guilty. There's no doubt in my mind that they'd done it. And um, 
you're sitting there thinking, I hope it come back with the right verdict. It took the jury just 45 minutes to make their decision. On the 4th of December 2003, Christina Button and Simon Tannehill were found guilty of the murder of George Button. They were both sentenced to life imprisonment. In little over a week, detectives from Durham Constabulary had identified the perpetrators of a brutal and vicious crime, a crime that the victim could never have imagined his wife was capable of planning or indeed of carrying out. He was a man who only worked to support his family and the solution to their problems was to kill him. And I really can't think of anything more evil than that. It makes no sense. I mean, to do it for any reason is horrific, but for what? £450,000. It's just not worth it. The consequences aren't, aren't worth it. As often I still think back that he almost, wait, well, he almost certainly knew who did it. They left him lying there, he wasn't dead, they left him lying there. And there's nobody could help him. He just left lying, and I often think of that. <laughs>